Uh, we'll be talking with Daryl Sims tonight. And before we get into that, I just wanted to kind of give a heads up on Paranexus. We've made some changes, and I wanted to announce those on the show tonight as well. I did announce them in the newsletter today. But we've done some restructuring. We've opened up the forums so that uh, the public can register and join in on the, most of the areas of the forums without being a Paranexus member, but we'd love to have you as a member too. We are doing some different things. We've added a blog for forum members if they'd like to do that. We've also got an updated gallery, which is going to be a little easier to use. But probably one of the more exciting things that we're working on is we're discontinuing the World Alliance Partner Program, and we're working to build the network of field investigators who will undergo some pretty decent training, and that's going to be coming up in the next month or two. And so we're getting some indications of interest of folks who would like to be a part of that field investigator program and we'll be making more announcements, giving more information as the uh, days and weeks unfold here. We have given a new facelift to Paranexus as well and made it a little simpler, and we'll continue to enhance that as we go. So just wanted to mention that. Take a look at Paranexus.org. We'd love to have you as a member and share your expertise, your knowledge, and your experiences with others of like mind. One other change that I should uh, announce as well is we're really tightening the focus a little bit. We're going to focus really primarily on parapsychology and along with that in the parapsychological field would be the hauntings aspect. The parapsychology and ufology along with abductions is going to be really the focus. We're kind of letting cryptozoology go as a, as a, a focus area. It's just really not so much in the anomalous field. It's more in the naturally explained field, and they will even state that, the, the cryptozoologists, even though we're still interested in it, very eclectic interest, and we will still continue to have folks on the show who are cryptozoologists and so forth. So take a look at paranexus.org. We'd love to have you as a member if you're not already. Uh, tonight, we'd love to have your call-ins if you'd like to give us a shout. Our numbers are on your screen, 347-945-7799. There's also the click to talk button on your screen. If you've got a headset on your computer, you can click on that and connect with us as well. Otherwise, join us in the chat room. If you've got questions for Daryl or any of us tonight, you can type them in there too. So without any further ado, let's talk uh, with Daryl Sims. Daryl is a registered hypnotic anesthesiologist, certified master hypnotherapist, certified master neurolinguistic practitioner, international speaker, licensed private investigator, and researcher of alleged human-alien encounters. His discoveries of the alleged alien implantation, implantation rather, around 1960 and fluorescence around 1992 found in abduct on abductees due to contact by alien entities are but two of his finds in the medical scientific dream team that he uses to explore. His presentations have been to the medical and scientific conferences to show compelling approaches about alleged human alien contact events. We're really excited to have Daryl with us tonight. Daryl, welcome to Paranexus Universe. Oh, it's, uh, this is totally my pleasure. I mean, I'm really enjoying this tonight. This is great. Oh, it's, it's so nice to have you. Yeah, we really appreciate your time. You know, I, I was watching reruns of UFO Files here a week or two ago and saw you on that uh, doing a, a regression. Was that with Donna? Donna Ross? Lee. Donna she Lee. Was one of my doctors that was on uh, uh, Bill O'Reilly here a while back. Mm, he really? treated uh, both of them with great respect. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my uh, um, extremely, and I mean, when I say extreme, I mean far left, way out there friends, Mm -hmm. uh, called me and said that uh, Bill O'Reilly will tear him apart. And I kind of laughed and I said, uh, I don't think so. They went on and were treated uh, very kindly. And he oh, looked at them and at their story and he said, my goodness, I would, I would keep that uh, to myself if that happened to me. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, it's just amazing how well he treated them. Wow. Interesting That's enough, that, that is amazing. Yeah. CNN called. Uh, sure, it was Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely Bill O'Reilly. He, he was <laughs> fair with him. The uh, uh, CNN, uh, by the way, called uh, about two, a week later, and uh, they sent th uh, 
uh, one of their main producers out here and spent two days at, uh, at a little ranch. And um, they were the ones that didn't treat us fair. They swore to, the, to buy everything real that they would. And, um, and in fact, uh, the regression you're seeing there is from the CNN uh, production. And they they did everything they could to make it look like it was at nighttime and he was fuzzy. He wasn't fuzzy at all. The the man was abducted uh, when when he was a child numerous times with another little boy. The police uh, there was a police report there, and I mean this thing was just all over the news. And then the kids all of a sudden show up clean across Houston. Wow. Uh, and they knocked on the lady's door and said, it's getting dark, you know, we can't find our mom and dad. And, and the lady said, oh, my God, you're the, the little boys that are missing. And she calls the police, and they couldn't pick them up and said, all right, who got you? And, of course, they couldn't describe anything other than an alien entity. Hmm. Uh, well, you can imagine, the, well, this happened numerous times to them. Of course, CNN tried to make it look like it was a bad dream or something. This was in broad daylight, 11 o'clock in the day really? when this happened. This is not... I just couldn't believe the the uh, dishonesty that CNN uh, laid out. I just, I just couldn't believe it. Yeah, well. Well, you know, but 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 you know, by the same token, Daryl. I mean, when have we ever seen a real? Well, I mean, there's always exceptions to the rule. But when have you ever seen a documentary by a major network that really treats the whole subject fairly? It seems that they all come in with a tongue-in-cheek attitude on just about anything, whether it's ABC, CNN. I mean, uh, Miles. Uh, I'm trying to remember the fellow that was right. in some more. Yeah, I did, did did a thing on UFOs not too long ago, which is kind of tongue in cheek too. Yeah, he uh, actually he called me uh, about uh, three weeks ago and uh, said he was coming to Houston and uh, he con- contacted my media consultant and uh, they worked the deal out uh, in writing that um, we would you know I generally get this stuff in writing when I can mm-hmm. uh, and how how the material is going to be presented and. Uh, Lo and behold, I uh, didn't hear from him for a week, and she wrote him and said, are you still coming? He said, yes. And then this week, he, there's a big news blurb. I just got an email today. It says he and six other people at major hitters at CNN quit. Really? Oh, so, I didn't I, hear about that. Wow, that's pretty wild. Got his, everything. I thought, well, there goes the interview. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've I reamed him about uh, how bad the CNN did this program before. I said, now, a lot of UFO people would probably like it because – because it's good press. Mm-hmm. I thought I didn't like it because it was not what they said they were going to do. I, right. They wanted me to debate, for instance, Dr. Susan Clancy and Dr. Blackmore yeah. in, in uh, Harvard and, and, mm-hmm. and in England. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, there's no point in discussing yeah. that I said, because I already won. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? That's, I don't no like that attitude. And but that's not even said, really I, their area of expertise, I wouldn't think. Well, you just said how they how can you do that? And I said, it's very simple. I said, Dr. Uh, Susan Clancy's work is based on uh, the premise that uh, this is sleep paralysis or some uh, other fixation thereof. And she said, that's correct. And I said, and she said, what's wrong with debating that? And I said, uh, over 64% of the events that occur are in daylight. The people are wide awake when it happens. It mm. goes up to 92% in South America. I wow. win. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not sleep paralysis. I said, now, she wants to debate sleep paralysis and these events that occur at night, she might have some grounds to argue. Sure. But not daytime. Mm-hmm. I said, so we win. Yeah. Well, they bo- didn't bother to put that in the interview at all. Wow. Well, and then but- all kinds of evidence and they, uh, and they and scientific evidence done by uh, science labs from, you name it, Los Alamos, New Mexico Tech, uh, everywhere and uh, they didn't include any of that why don't you bring us up to speed on how you got into this how it all started well that's uh that's that's a story in itself uh basically how this all happened for me i guess i guess you could say i was a captive audience yeah (laughs) Yeah. i'm I'm an abductee too so last week i couldn't spell it now i one (laughs) Uh that's funny so did 19... your experiences take place in childhood, Daryl? 1952, age uh-huh. three and a half when it started. Uh-huh. So uh, I, uh, it was uh, in Midland, Texas, in um, 1305 Ohio Street. Excuse me, that's not correct. It's 
1005 South K Street, Midland, Texas. And uh, my mother was watching, she's 80 years old now, and she was watching a program on History Channel or something a while back, and she says, Darrell, they, I mean, I know you did the UFO investigations, but, well, I was watching a program, and they said you were an abductee. And I said, uh, well, uh, yeah. And she says, well, that's not right. And I said, uh, well, actually, it is. Well, it's hmm. impossible. And I told her the same story I'm telling you. And she says, but how could you couldn't remember when you were that young? I said, Mama, I said, the address is 1005 South K Street, Midland, Texas. She said, how do you know that? And I said, I lived there. <laughs> well, just because I was little doesn't mean I was stupid or didn't have a memory. Mm-hmm. That comes later. <laughs> that's, 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 just that's, ask me. I, so anyway, I, I told her the story. I said, I, I said uh, you'd put me in bed, and uh, you guys had gone off, and uh, I said I'd starting to drift off sleep, and all of a sudden uh, I noticed something was wrong. And I sat up in bed quick then, and I noticed somebody was in the room. Uh, they were actually leaving. The room, and I couldn't figure out well where. First of all, I didn't know what it was or who they were, and I couldn't figure out where they were going because they were walking to the, toward the wall. I mean, there's no door there. Hmm. I mean, that didn't make any sense to me at all. It was obvious that I had. Uh, now that I looked at the story after much investigation, I caught them as they were leaving, going out through the wall. When they realized, this entity realized that I was awake. And watching him, he realized he had to fix the problem. You're not supposed to remember these events, right. not the truth of them anyway. So he came back, and uh, as he turned toward me and looked at me, I noticed he had large black eyes and long, skinny arms and skinny legs, and uh, had he had perfectly round, uh, round black eyes, not not the elliptical eyes you see in the Hollywood version of the alien now. But uh, back then in the 60s, they had perfectly round black eyes. And uh, people asked me, well, what do you, how do you account for that? And I said, I, I, I don't account for it at all. It's, it's just what it is. I said, the only possibility I can think of is I was looking at a Ford model, and you guys were looking at a Lexus. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he says, what do you mean? I said, I think you got my, my message there quite clearly. I said, you're just looking at different models. Right. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, and it's, it's one guy was interviewing me one night. He says, hey, well, there are at least 69 different kinds of races of aliens. I said, now, how do you know that? <laughs> how do you know that? First of all, have you ever seen aliens? No. I said, have you ever seen a UFO? No. you ever seen this? you ever seen that? No, no, no. I said, okay, then how do you know anything? I said, you're just parroting what somebody told you. You don't have, you don't, in a court of law, you couldn't testify because you simply haven't seen or been there. And I said, first of all, uh, the 69 alien thing. I said, let's, um, I said, I could tell you a story about that and where that story first came from. And I caught the guy. He was here in Houston speaking at a, at a, at a dinner with uh, me and, and uh, another guy with some rich guy. And uh, he had asked us to come speak. And my, my point of this whole thing is that um, – there was there was this awful uh, guy there who was a pretty was pretty prominent in the UFO field then, and uh, is now. He finally got debunked, and everybody realized he's a liar. But he was out telling the story about these sixty nine different races of aliens. And I told him, I said, uh, I said, well, where do you where do you get this information? And he looked at me kind of funny and says, uh, well, uh, 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 well, and I said, go ahead and tell me. And he said, well, they tell me you can determine whether people are lying or telling the truth just by watching them. I said, I'm very good at that, actually. You're kind of watching me, aren't you? And I said, you, you better believe it. <laughs> he said, <laughs> I mean, uh, this is right in front of a, a, a millionaire that you know, has $14 million, and he's got a, this big dinner for this bunch of businessmen. He's invited me, and this guy, he flew this guy in. I couldn't believe it. Oh. And, uh, and so I just bumped this guy in front of me, and I said, well, where did you get this story? And he said it... <laughs> He said, actually, we made it up. Oh, no. And wow. um, I said, that's, um, I said, you know, the problem is if I, if I expose somebody like you at a UFO conference for lying and doing this kind of stuff, I said, they consider me a government agent. I said, however, if you sit here and admit it in front of everybody, you're just a liar. 
And so the problem is you're going to go to conference next week and you're going to, you're going to go ahead and you're going to go ahead and uh, tell everybody the whole story again, and that story still prevails, the 69 alien story. And that's where it came from. He's one of the people that was called the Gulf Breeze 6. Hmm. And this is a matter of public record, this whole story I'm telling you about. It happened in Houston, Texas. And he sat there and admitted he made, it, made the story up. And, uh, I mean, I, I, you just wouldn't even believe the story. Anyway, uh, back to my... <laughs> my little story in the in the little room and in the abduction. But the the entity uh, saw me and he realized he had made a, apparently made a mistake. So he's moving toward me. And then at this moment, I became instantly paralyzed with enormous fear. Well, two things were wrong with that that picture. Number one, I wasn't paralyzed the moments before, and two, I've never been that afraid in my entire life. I, I mean. I mean, I'm only three and a half, four, nearly four years old. I don't get major fear. I just right. get it. You know, there, there's no, there's no frame of reference for me. So it took me years to figure this out, but uh, I'm a little slow. But uh, I finally figured out that it was his fear he was adding to me. Huh. Really? That's one of the. That's a whole story in itself. Yeah. It was in that fear and that paralysis that he installed this. This paralysis is a suggestion, and the fear is something he actually installs in it. And uh, the next thing he started to do is moving toward me. Where they, generally, when they do that, they're going to put that large black eye right next to your face, mm-hmm. and they're going to reprogram you with what Susan Clancy and Dr. Blackmore would be very, very happy to hear, what a true false memory really is. And that's when the alien gets close to you, and he, he automatically uh, programs you with a nonsensical bit of imagery, usually a large black owl with large black eyes or a deer or some other nonsensical creature that you know wasn't in your bedroom. Squirrel. So you think it's a bad dream. Mm-hmm. The only problem is uh, when he started moving toward me, even though I was paralyzed, I, <laughs> I freaked and I pushed as hard as I could for my, against the wall of my little bed and I fell down uh, in the covers of the, my head and part of me and and my real legs were up still partially up on the bed. I fell between the walls. The bed pushed apart from the wall. I fell down there and got wrapped up in the cover. I mean, it was a mess. And then this thing, I thought, you know, that was, that was at least good because I wasn't seeing him. And then all of a sudden he, this time you talk about a bad, bad, horrible. I mean, if it was a nightmare, there couldn't have been any better. He lifts up the cover on my bed under the underneath. And there I am looking at him, of course, little tiny bed. And there he is looking at me face to face with that large black eye and those large bulbous head. And uh, man, I mean, it's just like something out of a, a nightmare because I, did, I didn't see monster movies back then, but it, have I, I've seen them since. And that one definitely could k- take the cake. And I kept shaking my little head over and over, back and forth, and, and yelling, "No, no, 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 no!" Because I knew he was kept trying to program me to think of a circus clown. He, that was going to be my screen memory. He was going to make me think I had a bad dream and I saw a circus clown. Now, he didn't shapeshift or change his image into that. He tried to change my thinking to think he was a clown. Mm-hmm. Well, after uh, 40 years of investigation, I'm still of the opinion he's a clown. But the fact is he wasn't the one that he was trying to make himself out to be. The fact is what he was really doing was trying to influence me and make me think that that event never, ever even happened. Well, it did, and I remembered it, and I wanted to remember at age four who he really was and what he, what he was there to do. And rather than the whopper, he was trying to get me to believe that it never even happened. So that was, um, for all intents and purposes, it, it, there's another observation that was interesting, too. I, I think maybe your audience would be use, find useful and some of them may already know this. When I looked at him, I was puzzled. I sat up in bed. I was actually puzzled. I mean, I couldn't figure out, first of all, who he was and what he was doing in my room. And he, he, why he, he didn't have any clothes on. When he turned around, I noticed he didn't have a TT. I mean, if you don't wear clothes in a room and a bunch of little kids are there, what do you think they're going to look at? <laughs> they do. I, I have mean, no idea. 
Well, and they they would definitely anybody probably most most people would anyway. But I noticed he didn't have a TT, and I did. He didn't have a belly button. I did. He didn't have uh, nipples, and I did. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. I still hadn't figured it out. I had no idea what an alien was. I mean, I didn't have a clue about any of this. I just couldn't figure out why he wasn't like us. Well, after 38 years of investigating, I finally decided that um, that if you don't have genitalia, you don't reproduce. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a navel, a belly button, you didn't get here by birth. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have mammary glands, you don't suckle. So whatever they are, they're not anything like us. They're either manufactured, cloned, or hatched, mm. or some combination thereof. We have some physical evidence that indicates that some of these guys might be biological and metallic. Borg. I don't know. Interesting. Now let's... um. Let's go back to one thing that you said. You said that the fear you felt was essentially the entity's fear, correct? Yes. Can you expand on that, or do you know much about that, or have you seen that? Sure. Yeah, to talk to me about that. That's very interesting. Well, um, the uh, it, it, I think I need to tell your audience as well that this is not stuff that we sit around and make up or imagine or hallucinate and say, oh, that must be what it is, and so therefore that's it. Uh, we, this, we, this is talking about 38 years of research here. We, so We have abductees in the audience. Good, good. And some of them will really enjoy this because they're going to, uh, if they're piecing this thing together, some of these are going to be missing pieces of the puzzle that they're going to really enjoy putting together with their own information. But basically, the the smaller gray character. Let's let's look at the lineup. I call them the usual suspects. If you line them up in a lineup, just like a police lineup, and I used to be a cop, so I'm, I've seen this before. If you line all of the entities up, generally you start off with the little gray guy. This is not limited to all of them, but this we're just going to make list a few. The little gray guy, who is uh, usually about two and a half to three and a half feet tall little bug-eyed uh, character, and he has an IQ of about 80. Hmm. 80. That's about the level of a moron. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He can't do much of anything. He, he's like a 286 computer with legs. <laughs> mm-hmm. Whatever you put in that computer, that's all it can do, and if you put a program that's too big for it, he can't handle it. Hmm. I mean, like your 286 computer, it just can't mm-hmm. handle it. You put light wave in it, and it just won't, it won't work. It won't even load. You just can't handle it. And he's the same way. Now, it's, this is not an attack on the alien entities like, oh, Daryl, he's alien, so he's picking on them. No, I'm simply stating a fact. The entities, these entities, the small ones, are made, manufactured, or created this way on purpose. Hmm. The, the alien hierarchy is vastly different than the UFO community recognizes, in my opinion. Vastly different. And I'll explain that in a moment. The second entity that generally is discussed is a taller gray-like creature. He is often referred to as the doctor. In other words, the little guy picks you up like pizza, brings you to the uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> brings you the pizza parlor, so to speak, in the, in the <laughs> and uh, you get to figure out that you're for dinner, so to speak. Dining in, speaking of course. But the fact is that you're. Uh, you're not the guest. You're you're uh, you're on the menu, so to speak. You're you're the business for the evening. So the gray type entity that the little guys bring, there may be two or three of them to pick you up and bring you to, is a guy often that many abductees simply refer to as the doctor. He was like a doctor to me, and by that in, I mean his int- IQ is probably about 140, 145, maybe 150. He's real smart. He knows exactly what he's doing, and these little gray guys are terrified of him. I mean, they're scared of him. If they make any mistakes or drop anything or do anything stupid, uh, if you're paying attention, you'll see him get really upset with them, and they get scared because their existence uh, probably hangs by a thread. It's not a society in which 
uh, forgiveness and uh, love and kindness. These are things they don't know anything about, and they don't care. They use it, but they don't. Use, it's not theirs. It, your emotions to them are like an infestation, and your your idea of of, uh, of uh, free will is uh, absolutely abhorrent, and and literally, um, it, it's like more like a computer virus as far as they're concerned. Hmm. If you so, that, free will. so you see them as a, as sort of a hive mentality, huh? Uh, yes, but but that's not that's not exclusive. It, it, mm-hmm. It's exclusive that it fits all, but it fits some of them more than others. The little guys, in other words, the queen, the queen bee, a queen bee is an example, and uh, uh, it, it knows all about the hive mentality, but she's not part of it, so to speak. She is right. it. Right. And the little guys, they don't know anything else. That's all they do. And the drones, they know what they do. And that's, that's it. Everybody has a job, so to speak. The next in the lineage of looking at some of these entities is a mantis-like being. And this guy can be anywhere between five to seven foot tall, absolutely horrific in appearance. Um, some people love him and others think he is just evil. Uh, I won't debate that per se, but I, I mean, I'll comment on these things if we have questions later on. But the fact is that the... This entity is extremely intelligent. He's, he's smarter than the doctor. Then you've got uh, another entity uh, that, that I'll go about here. And one is a, a reptile-like looking creature. Um, <clears throat> probably the best description you can get, get of him is probably in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. Excuse me, the third chapter. Uh, when this uh, creature comes walking in the Garden of Eden. And... Uh, a long story short is this is a reptile creature. They are extremely um, often violent and uh, fairly dangerous characters. The another group that we'll speak about is one that Travis Walton, my friend, uh, saw on his uh, adventure uh, when he was gone for five days. And in his event, uh, he saw the little grays, got scared, picked up something, was going to hit him with it, and all of a sudden this big tall blonde-haired, Nordic-like man walks in the room and uh, kind of placates Travis. The way he did that, in my opinion, was to simply by the the fact that he looked like us, so to speak, so therefore he's human and therefore there's no more danger, really, right? Right. The fact is that this, this, the, the, the hybrid, he's a hybrid, this, uh, this human entity, stands there. They, everybody thinks they're all blonde-haired and blue-eyed. That's not true. The fact is there are red-haired ones. Uh, in fact, in ancient times, the American Indians called them the sasistas, the red-haired giant ones. So white, the white, they're white people with red hair. Uh, back in the 17, 1800s, they refer to this. The, um, uh, the fact is there are black-haired ones, there, and there are different kinds of them, too, not just these tall, beautiful, Nordic type. Uh, if, to put it in context, these um, Greek god type people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that'll give you some context for it. So he's there, and then there's another creature referred to, and, I, and, and I'm embarrassed to even mention half of this because it sounds so crazy. It really does. Uh, there's another creature that was in our uh, in an event. We had eight people abducted at the same time, same place, uh, December 8th and December 11th, in the double mass abduction on two nights in 1992, and all of them described these entities in the same events and the same everything, and one of the entities they saw, and this is amazing, <laughs> and I asked my senior investigator describing me, he said, well, uh, he laughed, and he says, he's an engineer, he says, it looked like a Wookiee. <laughs> I said, I, he said, well, he said, some people would probably call it a Bigfoot. He said, but it was standing there with the lineup of these others. And he said he had never said anything. He was about seven foot tall. He didn't say anything. He didn't do anything. He didn't move. And he said uh, he just stood there. I don't, he said I had no idea what he was doing there or what he, or what he was. He said that but he looked like a Bigfoot type creature to me. So that's the gen- generic lineup. Now, there are all kinds of people, and I'll give you a quick example because I, this is definitely going to come up in the conversation. 
when I was in Brazil uh, several times, the first time, uh, a gentleman came to me and said, I'm very impressed with your work. He said, would you please read my stuff? And I said, sure. He gave me his book, and it had like 170 kinds of aliens uh, that have been in Brazil for the last 30, 40 years in these abduction events. Hmm. And next morning he says, did, uh, did you enjoy the book? And I said, oh, yes. And I said, uh, the problem is I don't speak Portuguese, so I did, didn't read much of it. But I did look at the pictures, and the pictures were most instructive for me. He said, really? He said, well, what do you think of all our different kinds of aliens? I said, I don't think you have any more than we do. He said, I beg your pardon? I said, if you'll look at the entities carefully and the UFOs that are described with, I said, many of them, most of them, have large black eyes. He said, yes. I said, that's useful programming. Hmm. Now, these entities look, see through, they see infrared, ultraviolet, X-ray, and visible light through those lenses. Period. I said, now, that's important. I said, now, this is, if you think about that, it makes a ton of sense. I said, so... I saw these large black eyes on all these different creatures. And he said, well, they're different creatures. I said, no, they're people describing what they were influenced by in their screen memory. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, well, most of them have black eyes. I said, that's true. He said, well, what about the giants? And I said, now that's even more interesting to me. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, the giant, uh, giant uh, aliens that you have out there, usually there's a craft about half the size of the giant. He said, what are you saying? I said, what I'm saying is that you've got another screensaver. Mm. I said, that giant didn't fit inside that little tiny UFO and then fly off. And I mean, you're probably really crowded in there. You know, several others in there. Mm -hmm. And he laughed and he says, well, he said, that really makes a lot of sense. So uh, that was my, my little thesis on his his whole business there. But uh, the fact is that uh, these entities are extremely good at creating virtual reality scenarios. And in the double mass abduction event, which is, uh, and we can talk about that some other time if you want to, it's, uh, uh, they call me Alien Hunter. And I got that name from a, a, a writer up, um, in Atlanta in 1994 when she's interviewing me. She says, oh, my God, you hunt. You're hunting them. I said, uh, Duh, yeah. <laughs> she says, but you're an alien hunter. I said, that's correct. And she says, well, anyway, it stopped from then. So Good name. The, that I, the, I decided to um, do something proactive. Instead of listening to other people's events about their abduction and these wonderful and amazing accounts and some of them whinings and woe is me and all this stuff, I decided, why don't we go after them? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what I do. I mean, I am a hypnotic anesthesia therapist. Mm -hmm. I'm a master trainer in, in NLP and, and in therapy. I train and certify people in these fields. I do have an intelligence background. And I have some policing background as well. Why don't I just see if I can set a trap? I don't know it'll work, but we'll try it. So I decided to create our own Manchurian candidate. Really? I ask a volunteer. Now, this is there, a lot of people say, well, you're an abductee, not a contactee, so you chose an abductee. No, I didn't. I chose a contactee, someone opposite of my view. So she volunteered. She said, you've never charged us a penny. Your work is philanthropic. You know, you're just, uh, we just love you to death, and I'll volunteer for your program. I said, well... <clears throat> I can't tell you anything about it. She says, why not? And I said, because they're going to find out about it, and that's the whole point. And I said, what I'm going to do is install a memory in you, and I'm going to install amnesia on the other side of it so they can't figure out where it came from. Because if they find out what it is, and if, it's, if it, the information is as dangerous to them as I think that it is, if I'm right, they're going to want to know where that came from. I said, it's tantamount to me and you come over for dinner, and let's say I'm a, uh, in the member of the intelligence community, and all of a sudden uh, you're sitting at dinner with me, uh, and our families are all sitting there, and all of a sudden you start telling me about some gigantic nuclear secret or something sitting at the dinner table. Do you think I might be interested? Yeah. Well, of course I will. And do you think you'll be watched forever? You will. <laughs> That's what it works. And uh, so 
if she goes in there and blurts this information out, which is what I intend for her to do, I program her to do this, then uh, if the information I've gotten surreptitiously is correct about them, and they are an intelligence outfit, just like many of our outfits are, and they respond accordingly like an intelligence outfit, <clears throat> I mean, if it looks like a rose, it smells like a rose, and it came off a rose bush, <laughs> It arose. Now, I'm just guessing here. So uh, I went ahead with the experiment, and I installed amnesia on the front side of the memory because as soon as they meet you, they download everything you have, usually very rapidly. In other words, if you have a trap for them, they know it immediately. That's why you set up your video camera and so on. They usually usually find it turned off or turned the other direction, or they won't come that night because they're sitting there listening to you. They, they're, they're listening to what you've done in your own head. So that's why a lot of that stuff will work. So I installed amnesia on the front side so she didn't even know that she had the information. And she, I put all this on film, so uh, I would show it to her later as I told her. And uh, I said, but only after this event is over. And, and, and we don't even know it'll work. I said, if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter anyway. And she says, okay. She says, what do I do? I looked at her smile and said, sleep. And she just fell over. Okay. And then the camera's rolling, and I installed the piece of information that I've gotten from an abductee who was not supposed to see what he saw and hear what he heard, and installed it in her as if it were her own memory. Now, the, <clears throat> the post-it not suggestion is on one side, and post-it not suggestion on the other side, one to not remember who did this, where you got it, in other words, and uh, the first, the other one was um, that you won't remember anything until uh, I set the post it my suggestion to go off uh, 18 inches in front of the guy. When he got, if, if she came back and got her, he was picking her up about once a month. So I figured if he got her again this month, this would be perfect. So she moves to Florida, and um, lo and behold, they got her, uh, I think, on the 24th of the uh, night before Thanksgiving. And long story short, is uh, she's, uh, he comes in, it's a regular guy, I call him your handler, because that, you know exactly which one is the one that handles you. He's assigned to you from the time they get you the first time. Hmm. And so she's um, trying to get her gown on, and he and the sleeve's inside out, and she's kind of groggy, you know, the way, they are, the way these many people are when they pick you up. And he, he doesn't care that she has a gown on or not, but because he's fixing to beam her out of there, so to speak. And she is uh, trying to get her arm in the sleeve, and it's, the sleeve's all messed up. And finally, he grabs the thing and just throws it on the bed and said, you don't need that. Mentally, he told her this. And uh, she's okay. And she's very nonviolent and very easy to get along, very docile, you know, perfect uh, uh, lab rat for them. So uh, anyway, he starts getting closer to her, and he gets within about 18, 20 inches of her, and all of a sudden, she wakes up completely 100%, just like you and I are right now. Wow. And the problem is she did something I did not anticipate her to do. That's First thing she said was, Daryl knows what you're doing. <laughs> oh, oh, my right. gosh. Oh, my. Oh, please don't say that. And she did. So that's the cat's out of the bag. <clears throat> and at that point, she blurted out this information that I said in a, as a post-it not suggestion. And he was, she said, for the first time, Daryl, in 30 years, said, I've been abducted since I was three. And she said, I'm 33 now. In 30, 30 years, she said, I've never, ever in my life seen him horrified, stunned, shocked, and that sort of thing. Said he was mortified as I said a bunch of stuff that I have no idea where it came from. And I said, you mean he felt like he was interested in it? She said he felt like it was like I just told state secrets or something. And um, she said, what well, was all that about? And I said, it's okay, don't worry about it. And then she went on to explain <clears throat> that he finally took her that night. But anyway, a short period later, about uh, two weeks later, now this is where the story gets hugely great, amazing. And there's more physical evidence in this case, physical evidence, than in all the cases we had up to that time. That, that much physical evidence. <clears throat> this is incredible. <clears throat> About three weeks later, on December 8th, 1992, eight abductees get picked up 
in Houston and surrounding cities and where she's at in Florida. All of them are my abductees. One of them is my chief investigator. What do you think that's all about? Mm-hmm. Somebody's looking in on what? Mm-hmm. They're looking for holes in the story. They want to find out where this thing came from and, and why. So I guess the information is more important than we thought it was, than I thought it was. So anyway, uh, they also dropped everybody off on December 8th, picked them up and brought them back a few hours later. And then then in um, three nights later, they picked everybody up again and dropped them off again. And those that had, had re- uh, received implantation that night, uh, their implants were removed except for one lady. They missed her, the housing for a an ocular implant, and it fell out of her eye at work the next day in front of her boss. Hmm. And I got it. Cool. Pretty neat stuff. Lots of evidence. My senior investigator calls me and says, something's really wrong, Dale. You need to get over here right away. And I said, what is the problem, Dale? We still don't know what's happened yet. This is all happening without us putting any of this together. People are just starting to call me and say, something weird's going on. You know, I feel weird. Something's going on. Something weird's happened. So I said, what happened, Dale? And he says, my fingernails are growing at a rapid rate. He said, I'm having to trim them two and three times a day. Wow. He said, I'm abducted and I don't even know it. So I go over and work with him. Right off the bat, he identifies you know, the people that are there, and I called all these other people, separated them, wouldn't let them talk to anyone. And then I worked with each one individually and got the exact same story, same location, same everything. So Dale's coming over. My senior investigator, who's an engineer, comes over. He's, he's coming over for me to work with him. He said, something really weird happened. And uh, he said, you know, after that session you had with me, he said, I've been doing a little research. And I said, okay. He said, uh, that craft I described to you, and I said, yeah, and I said, how big was it? And he said, well, there was a small craft that picked me up and the other people, and he said, then it took us to one that was huge. I said, what does huge mean, Dale? He said, uh, approximately 600 miles across and 50 miles thick. Holy crap. And I said, well, Dale, I said, uh, I do have a problem with that. And I said, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just don't buy everything that people say, and including you. <laughs> and he said, I thought you would say that, so I brought the video. The video? I said, what did you say? He said, I brought the video. He said, it seems that a Japanese astronomer was filming the moon between December 8th and December 11th during that time frame in, in December 1992, and he accidentally caught a craft of immense size going between the Earth and the moon, leaving its shadow on the moon in slow motion. Here's the film. Don't wait for the book. Just watch the movie. I, I think it's our craft. I think that's it. So the whole issue of this whole thing is that it caused a huge stink. Now, for a craft that big to show up, probably means somebody bigger is on it. It's kind of like boats. You know, you got a captain of a boat, and you got skippers mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. different things. Then you got, well, this thing's like admiralty. And I said, does anybody, and I asked everybody the same thing. As I questioned each of them individually, I said, do you sense that there's anything going on tonight that's uh, it, it's the same or different than normal? They said, no, no, it's like, and this one lady said, it's like an admiral's on board the ship. And no, there were not going to be any mistakes tonight. Said everybody is scared to death. I mean, everybody, not just the little guys. Everybody is afraid. So uh, my senior investigator and this lady were taken into two separate rooms and questioned at great length. And again, this lineup of the usual suspects are standing there in front of Dale over to the side as he stands in front of this guy sitting in the big chair. The guy sitting in the big chair is, uh, this is where I differ from the UFO community. Uh, to me, to the UFO community, when I describe that lineup of the, the alien phenomena, to them, they think those are all the aliens. I don't. When if somebody shows me um, seven different cars or nine different cars, I don't have this idea that there are like seven different or nine different races of cars. Mm-hmm. I suspect that there are several models and there may be several manufacturers, so to speak. But what makes anybody think? And people, well, they have to be smart enough because I said, wait a minute. I said, don't, don't go making these assumptions yet. Yeah. Don't do that. You're going you're gonna to paint yourself into a corner you can't get out of. And the problem is this. Many of these entities have no opposing thumb. Really? 
They didn't build anything. If you don't have an opposing thumb, you don't build stuff. Many of these entities have long claws, like the Virginia incident with the alien in, involved, that, where they caught several of them, and the military still got them. In fact, we ended up getting them. The United States did. There's very good evidence of that. Uh, in the city of Virginia, to this day, there's a statue made of the Virginia alien. Believe me, he doesn't look like the, uh, the way the UFO people painted him and made him up to look like he's almost a really nice guy. The one they have in the middle of Virginia is a sculpture and painted in the, in the city of Virginia, Brazil. That thing's got four-inch claws on it. And, I mean, it looks like something that came out of the bottom of this pit. I mean, it is horrible looking. So my point is, <clears throat> it's highly unlikely that guy is in much, in, in much control of, a, probably not in control of a spacecraft <clears throat> unless, he's, uh, unless it has, uh, <laughs> like, a place for claws to be or something, you know, whatever. It's a little fun there, but um, <laughs> the, some of these guys don't make sense. Uh, let me give you an example. Here's, here's a really good one. Uh, most people, many people in this day and age, uh, because of school and programming and everything else, ascribe to the, the concept of evolution. I'm not one of them. If evolution is true, let's assume that it is, though. If evolution is true, the alien is a perfect example of why it isn't. In other words, you got the little gray guy, right, about three, two foot tall, three foot tall. Then you got the doctor, then the mantis, then the human, then the reptile, and then the uh, Bigfoot. Well, how does evolution work in that regard? You, do you, you see, a lot of people think that little guys grow up and turn into the doctor. They don't. What you're looking at is a finished product. It doesn't get any different. Well, it really they doesn't have anything to do with evolution or creation. It has to do with manufacturing. Exactly. I mean, the, the, the doctor's not going to turn into a reptile in a couple of days. Reptile's not going to turn into an insect. An insect's going to turn into a human. And then it turns into a rookie at the end. That just that 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 system of thinking um, <clears throat> it works here where you don't you know, when you're in power and you can uh, control schools and so on. But when you're on a on board a craft, that doesn't mean anything anymore. Well, let me ask you. Let me just go back to one point. I'm not sure if you were going to expand on it or not, or if you want to. But it's very interesting to me the the message or whatever that you implanted in the abductee that when she came awake, what was it that she was supposed to say or do? Uh, that is, <clears throat> here's the reason that is private. Because, and there's two things that are private about that event. Number one, the details about what, what went on there, and, uh, and, and so on. Because I get from time to time people who call me or email me, and they say, oh, in fact, there was a guy this last month that wrote me and said, I read your mass abduction thing. He said, that was incredible. What an amazing story. I was there, too. I said, really? Well, tell me about the walls. Tell me about this and tell me about that. What did you see? And he starts describing everything incorrectly. Mm -hmm. And he described the wrong beings and everything else. And I said, hmm. Well, thank you for calling. I appreciate your call. And he said, well, I was there. I'm just telling you. He said, I, I, I remember all that. And I said, yeah, well, then tell me who the other people were. Describe them. Because if you were there, they would certainly describe you. And he realized he'd kind of fall into this trap there. <clears throat> so if you keep this information separate, you can always use it to collate against it anyone right. who... Right. I mean, people are going to read the story, and they're just going to go out. It's the same thing that police do. In an investigation like a murder or, or a, a, a heinous crime, they'll keep out certain pit, bits of information. And somebody, because you get these people that cut, these people cut, copycat mm -hmm. and call up, all the time, they'll even confess to this stuff. Right. Oh, I killed her. I did this, and, and they and the cops will ask you, "Well, where'd you put the knife?" Uh, I threw it in the river. Okay, well, what color was it? What did it look like? And they, he describes the knife and find out it's an ice pick. You know, right. wrong. Sorry, nothing up. <laughs> sent him to the psych ward or something. No, he did confess to a crime that he didn't do. Well, let me ask you this. Was your exercise, your experiment here, was it successful as far as you're concerned? It was, in my view, because when I found out, when I found out, and again, and the only way I can probably explain this and make any sense out of this insane thing, is that my 
my uh, my view of the alien phenomena is that there is a hierarchy, mm-hmm. and all the aliens that we're looking at, the, I call the usual lineup, the usual suspects. Right. Many people think those are like higher, you know, one's a lower, one's a higher, one's a this, and one's a that. And what they don't understand is all those guys are low rent, low level, and they're working for somebody else. Well, that's, yeah. That that's don't make any decision. They do what they're told. And if there are other, several other layers of this thing, and it goes up, they don't, uh, that is, that's, 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 you're looking at the, uh, uh, the front line, so to speak, uh, and, that's uh, there's just much more to the same. In other words, if there were, if if we thought this is a hive, and there were different hives of these things, there would be a beekeeper somewhere, mm-hmm. and the beekeeper ain't like them. Which, runs. And do you have any clues as to who that could be or what they're all about? Well, that, that, um, uh, the, the reason I said all this, I'm teasing you a bit here for the yeah. purpose of of showing my thesis here, how I come, because part of the reason I come to this thesis, my thesis was that, number one, that they these entities act like an intelligence community, that they lie and they lie consistently. I mean, we did in the CIA. I mean, that's what we did. That, that, all intelligence agents have to do that. I mean, you sit around and tell the truth all the time. What secrets do you have? You don't. Well, I'll go talk to Russians this weekend and tell them everything I know, you know, tell them, you know. Now you hear next and on the all of a sudden you hear this this announcement on the news. You know, uh, Moscow on planes, missiles heading toward U.S. News at ten. You know yeah. that's the work. What was that yeah. from? That was from like Groove Tube or Tunnel yeah. Vision. <laughs> that's <funny. laughs> Moscow on planes, missiles and roof. Film at eleven. Yeah, really. Keep, yeah. keep tuned for, for more news. <laughs> <laughs> keep watching. <laughs> Don't look outside. So what happened? was a uh, someone, the, the information I'd gotten from this abductee, he didn't know, he just blurted it out, he didn't know it was of any value. He didn't know anything. He just sitting there, and I mean this in the kindest way, and it's not going to sound that way, but I do mean it kindly. He was whining about, oh, it's me, you know, they're doing all these weird things to me. And then he starts telling the story, and I'm sitting there, my hair is about to stand straight up, and I realize, oh, my gosh, if this information is accurate, if it can be proven, we probably have the first decent piece of intelligence on these guys. But I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's valid information or not. I, he he doesn't have a clue, and I have a sense that this thing may be good. Mm-hmm. The only way to test it is to get it into the field. So when we did the post-it nice gesture there, and she blurted all this out, they ended up coming getting these eight people in two states and several cities on these two different nights. And they did this, and the ship that came to pick them up, that took took them, the small craft, to the huge one. Uh, we have some wonderful drawings of it. They're going to end up on our website in, in about another month or two. Uh, when I am re- redesigning the entire website, so it's it's just going to be massively wonderful when we finish it. But uh, in this case, um, there's a. I'm, I'll just I'll I'll help you a little bit here. Uh, there's the usual lineup, and that's the alien entities that everybody sees. There's another group apart from them. I refer to them as the SS of the alien. And some people refer to some of these guys as MIBs. The fact is, if you have a problem in an event, and they can't, and the alien himself cannot solve the problem, they will send a MIB to cure the problem. A MIB, men in black. Men in black. Yeah, we use the word men because they look human-like. Some of them don't and some of them do. The point is that they're definitely not human, but they're human-like, and they know how to solve problems, and that's their job. They're just like the SS if there was one of the alien. All right. The, the second thing, think of them as kind of the police, one of the policing forces for this, this insanity, in my view. And then, then there's uh, mid-level management. Mid-level management are vastly different than what is what the show is going on down here that we refer to as "quote unquote" the alien phenomena. Well, the fact is that the alien phenomena has had different names all through history. They used to be dwarves, gnomes, fairies, mm. the jinn of Islam. 
you can call it anything you want to. And every race, every culture has a different name. But the amazing thing is that was the gospel truth of who they were back then. You get it? Right. Yeah, it was just their frame of reference, whatever historical time period they were in. One of the things that you said, Daryl, that I thought was really fascinating, and I, and I really uh, think is a very plausible concept, is the fact that when they do these screen memories, um, I've often thought that, that the Nordics were a complete screen memory. Uh, it, it's what's, what is absolutely palatable and what will calm the person at the time, particularly in the case of your friend, Travis Walton, uh, where you know, just by virtue of the fact that there was another human in a room after he was so startled, whether it was a true human or whether it was, whether it was some sort of false memory, I thought was a very useful way to manipulate. It, manipulation is, a, is the key word, and that's the name of the game. Uh, I, I assure you that the entities are quite real, and I would like to uh, carry this a little bit more forward, if I may. Um, For instance, well, if, uh, can, can we take a quick break, and then uh, let's come back to that? Start on the, uh, the, the Nordic and who they may be and, and the transgenics. Yeah. Back. Okay. That'd be great. All right. So, yeah, fascinating conversation. You've got me just riveted here. So um, we do have some questions that we'll take from the chat room as well when we come back from the break. Just be a few minutes. So uh, if you're listening, we appreciate your time. If you're listening to the live show, if you'll hang with us just for a bit, we'll be. And welcome back, everybody. Doug Kelly here, Paranexus University with Grant and our special guest, Daryl Sims, the alien hunter. Um, we've had a fascinating, fascinating discussion the first hour of this program. We do have some questions in the chat room, which we will get to just shortly. Um, if you've got questions you'd like to call in and talk, you can do that. The numbers are on your screen, 347-945-7799, or you can use the click to talk button on your screen if you have a, a, a headset. Now, um, Daryl, if we could, before we continue on with the rest of what we're the current uh, discussion, uh, if I could ask you just a few quick questions that are being asked in the chat room, and we can kind of give a succinct answer to those and then move on, unless they're going to be part of your later discussion. Sound good? Sure. Okay. Uh, from Sharon, is there any common or are there any common definitive experiences that indicate someone has been abducted? Absolutely. The... Um the, there, the fact is that uh, most people will uh, notice that there is a, a uh, the concept of uh, missing time. They will notice that they were supposed to be at some place, and there, for some reason, there's a missing period of time in their life. They can't put a, put put a, put the, the time frame together. For instance, you might be uh, go to dinner with somebody at seven o'clock, and you end up getting there at ten, and they can't. They're mad at you because you showed up three hours late. You don't know why. Uh, certain uh, marks, sc lumps, scars, uh, burns, and other things that you find on your body in the visible range of light and the infrared or even in the vis invisible range of uh, ultraviolet will show up. For any of the people listening, you can email me and I'll send you uh, a lot of this information and it's free. And uh, I'll be glad to do that. I answer all my emails. So you can email me. Go to my uh, website or you can just simply email me at <clears throat> Daryl W. Sims <clears throat> at uh, yahoo.com. That's D E R R E L W S I M S at yahoo.com. Can you give me a go to our website? Yeah. We're, we're doing a lot of work on it, so it's a mess there right now. But uh, And you can click on uh, Alien Hunter there, and it'll go directly to me as well. But uh, there are other things too. <clears throat> um, and your website is the Alien Hunter or alienhunter.com? AlienHunter.org. Oh, dot org. Okay, good. Or org. And uh, there are other things. <laughs> there, there are things like um, uh, about uh, we found about uh, sixty percent of women that have had these events uh, end up with endometriosis and other OBGYN problems, specifically that don't make any sense to uh, other people. Um, we find that men uh, who've gone through some of these experiences will experience a usually a penetration of needle-like mark in their uh, scrotum at some point in their experiences, and then they'll end up with sexual dysfunction for six months to a year and a half to two years. Um, uh, some of them will end up with a testicular implant in, in their uh, scrotum as a result. Um, there are all kinds of other things that uh, 
And I, as I said, if you, if you email me, I'll be glad to uh, answer those questions for you and, and give you a more detailed list. But uh, a lot of things are pretty obvious. Uh, missing time, uh, unusual markings on you that don't belong there, scrap marks and things like this, as if you were held down by something or someone, uh, bruisings of long fingered, uh, uh, na of nature usually of three long fingers, uh, where they held you down or, or held onto you pretty tightly, where you're trying to get loose, as an example. Um, a lot of things like it. So uh, okay. anyway. Uh, well, here's another question. Uh, do you think that they use individuals that are not knowing to create disinformation, uh, such as the UFO messiahs that keep coming popping up in the news? In other words, are, do, are these aliens using people who uh, unwittingly to create disinformation. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I'd love to comment on that. Uh, I, I get calls from people all the time saying that uh, they've seen Prophet Yahweh, right. uh, Wacko, uh, calling down UFOs, and this lady that was on the very world famous for saying the UFOs are all going to come awesome. down on this Good. day and so on. And she's in there crying in her soup, you know, because she said, but they told me. They did. I don't deny it. I don't think that she's lying. I don't they think did so. tell her all this. The problem is every two to five years, we get a new cosmic messiah representing the alien. Every two to five years, and they get totally debunked by the alien. They will tell them pretty good information, and then they get so confident in them, they know they're not lying, and they won't, they'll tell the truth. They believe in this whopper stuff, and then they give them the big day we're coming, and uh, nobody shows up. But the whole world does, and you get to be a three-alarm idiot. And it's really sad that this happens to these people, but uh, they, they come, they, and these people are set up by the alien. They, they love to do this stuff, and I don't know why, other than it keeps everybody, it, it keeps the giggle factor in the alien phenomena. It really does. It make, we debunk ourselves far worse than any uh, government outfit does. They don't need to do anything. We, we tend to destroy most of our own credibility all maybe, by ourselves. Maybe they're just deception junkies, you know? That that that's that's uh, name of the game. <laughs> okay. That's the name of the. Cool. A good answer. That's interesting. That you say that. I, I we thought that. All right. Um, I think this is the last question um, from Diane. I think. I hope I haven't missed any. I don't think I have. Uh, what is your view of abductees all having O type R H positive blood? Uh, that's, first of all, it's not true. Okay. Uh, I'm an abductee, and my, my blood's O negative. Okay. Uh, many, uh, there, is a, there is a huge, important thing, in my opinion, about the blood. Very important. We have, and now, the, the difference between a lot of people making these statements uh, and us is we're actually using science in the medical field to determine these things. When, if I tell you that... Uh, we found something in connection with the blood, as an example. I'll be basing it on uh, solid medical evidence, not solid, uh, interesting information that has no real scientific basis. In other words, I, I've been told by uh, people that uh, certain kinds of only abductees have this and they only have that, and that's just not true, uh, that, uh, <laughs> that implants only show up on the left side of the body. It's not true. These things are just patently not true. I discovered implants in 1960. I ought to know. Hmm. Uh, so... My point is that uh, that there we think that there is something about the blood that they they the alien is involved in, but I don't think that we have found it yet. Okay. The there information is, anecdotal, anecdotal right now. There is one last question, just a brief one. I uh, don't know if you caught it, but the question is, what did you think of the George Nori UFO TV show on Sci-Fi a few weeks ago? And I I think there was one on abductions. It was a couple three weeks ago. I don't know if you even caught it. I was. Uh, I didn't. I didn't catch the show. I was on uh, George Nuri here a while back, uh, uh, speaking about DNA and some of our uh, medical and science uh, finds and what we were the big gigantic DNA program we were going to begin and uh, and open that up for abductees and contactees alike, so that people can make get their claims done. But uh, I didn't see the show, so I'm not informed. All right. So let's pick up where we left off before the break we were talking about some of the different uh, hierarchy and so on and so forth and you wanted to talk about transgenics and what was the other yes the the let's go to, to catch up on this 
the an alien in times past was uh, in some cultures known as the jinn. If you're Islamic, the jinn. If you talk to uh, Islamic people about aliens, they look at you and almost laugh. They said, "Well, we don't we don't know anything about that." But if you say, look at them and say, "What do you know about the jinn?" Their physiology will change. They'll get scared and they'll say, "We don't talk about that." Mm-hmm. The reason they don't talk about it is because they're describing the same thing that you already know about. They just have a different term for it and a different ad- ideology. My point is that in every culture, what was true then, gnomes, fairies, etc., and the, the fairies of Ireland is a good example. I'm Irish and American Indian, and uh, that's this is another big component. 45% of our abductees are Native American Indian, Irish, Celtic. My point about that is this. The, the interesting thing that, that fascinates me is that the back the the fairies back in ancient times in Ireland and other places, um, they they weren't like the kind that you read in your storybooks. They're like uh, the wee folk, the little little short people, about two or three feet tall. Mm-hmm. And if things don't go well, they might not bring you back. And they're not friendly. Well, that's more like uh, alien abduction to me rather than a fairy tale. Mm-hmm. But my point is this. All these different cultures, and we can look back and smile, you know, with our little educated smile and say, there aren't any fairies, there aren't any gnomes, there aren't any dwarves, there aren't any of these things. Uh, those were, at best, green memories, and, and that's, that sounds great. The only problem is, here you come with, here, let's bring modern man on the scene all of a sudden. Here comes modern man dragging his uh, briefcase instead of a, instead of a club, and he's a lot smarter, he thinks. And uh, he looks at the same exact phenomena everybody's seen for at least, uh, at least the last six, seven thousand years, and he says those are not gnomes and fairies and anything; those are aliens. Now, how in the world do you know that? You see, every generation automatically it's weird because they're in charge; they think they know all the answers. Well, that's what a really what that's a really anybody? interesting point too, Daryl, because you know. Um, we can only view it for, through our frame of reference at the time. And so what it makes one wonder, and I, and I, and I think I, I see where you're driving at, and I think it's shared by a lot of other researchers, that perhaps this phenomena has been, we've been coexisting with this phenomena for thousands of years. It's all been in the, in the manner that we've interpreted it. And the, the issue to me is why the big secret Mm-hmm. Why are they afraid? Or why the why they're not afraid? Why will they not tell us who they are? Why why they're here? Why do they make up all these whoppers and say, "What do you mean whoppers?" I said, "Well, they tell one group of people they come from Banlon." I said, "Banlon's a deal brand. You know, I'm sorry that doesn't work." <laughs> and they well, they reticulate. Well, that's a little far, isn't it? So we're not going to be able to check you out, are we? Yet we find uh, uh, certain anomalies on Mars uh, uh, and several other moons of Jupiter. Uh, the Cassini Project, I was one of the two people outside of uh, JPL that was invited to an invitation-only meeting in California for the Cassini Project before they blasted it off. This was a project where they were going to send a spacecraft, the first nuclear-powered package in the space, and I stood up to the end of it. They know who I am. I don't know why they invited me, but I took them up on the offer and put their listening to an amazing, wonderful, powerful presentation from NASA and JPL. My point is that while I was there listening to this, at the end I asked a question. I said, you know, I said, we spent many, many years studying the moon before we ever went. And we sp- we're spending more time studying Mars before we ever go to there. And we're, we're getting ready to go there, but we're still doing a lot of stuff in reference to that. Why all of a sudden would you send a craft to some distant, much further than Mars, nuclear-powered craft, out in space to a little tiny, unknown, insignificant, little tiny moon. Mm-hmm. What, what did you find there that you're not telling anyone about? I mean, that whole room turned completely ice cold, and they dismissed the meeting. Stopped. Really? Question. And they know who I am. I'm not going to let them get away with that. I'm not going to do it. And uh, the point the point I thought was well taken. I'm not just saying a conspiracy. I just want to know the answer to the question. Why would you spend billions of dollars 
on a short trip, so to speak, compared to the long-range plans we have for Mars, what did you find? And it, obviously, it's something huge they found. That's the reason they're sending the craft there, doing all the things they're doing. That makes a lot of sense. Well, you know, I, it's never been to my satisfaction as far as, uh, uh, you know, some of the uh, missions to Mars. The most disappointing in my mind has been the recent polar lander, because what do we hear from that? We heard nothing. They clamped the lid down on that after about the second or third week, and we got nothing from that. Exactly. It, 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 it's just, the, 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 when they were doing the moon, the, the, this, is, uh, this is hilarious. Um, you're, you're familiar with the face on Mars, the original yeah. picture? Mm -hmm. well, I, I had that years before anybody even knew it existed. My brother, who was 10 years old at the time, went down to NASA, where it's right here in Houston, right outside of Houston. He went down to the display, and before, this was before they locked the cabinets. And he's kind of a curious guy, and he just opens up the glass cabinet, takes the picture off the <laughs> really? shuts the cabinet back up when nobody's around, and gives me the picture. He says, guess, what th guess where I got this? And I said, where'd you get that? And he said, from NASA. And he told me how he got it. Uh, and anyway, that's how I got my first picture of the face on Mars. Well, anyway, long story yeah. short, they, uh, they sent a second, uh, and there was such a big storm over this, uh, such an argument over why the uh, they, they why they didn't look at the face of Mars uh, much closer now that they had the craft up there and everything, and so they finally take a second look and it, it's 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 dustier and dirtier and smaller and more obscure than it ever was, and I'm sitting there laughing with my DS satellite specialist friend of mine, he said Daryl, he said there's not a rock on on the surface of that planet we couldn't see in great detail, much less a face about a mile across. Yeah. He says, nothing we can't see there. He said, I said, I said, I, I, some of these pictures I'm getting, I said, they're, they're so, it's so obvious. You can take a, a regular program in your computer and run it, run it through uh, the, these photos from Mars and Moon through your own computer, and you can see where they've, they've actually, someone has actually blanked out in certain parts of the picture. Mm -hmm. This is not detection. I mean, you don't have to be a computer whiz to do that. Is it possible, Daryl, that, that they don't know what's going on either? Or that they uh, can't I, I want to answer that in two ways. One, the answer is yes, and the answer is no. Mm -hmm. now, I'll, now I'll hopefully clear that up a bit. <clears throat> Number one, if you go to the front door of the Central Intelligence Agency, knock on the door, and they let you in, and you ask the big question, I want to know all about UFOs. They'll look at you like you're mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And the reason they'll think that is because they don't have a clue what you're talking about. And they don't. Mm -hmm. They don't have a clue. There is no such thing as the quote-unquote government, whatever that is, knows everything. There is no such thing called the government that knows everything. That's just conspiracy stuff. Mm -hmm. The fact is, yeah, if you went to the, if you could get to the right place inside the intelligence community, inside the CIA, NSA in particular, because CIA, you see, is only one eighth the size of NASA, uh, NSA. Mm -hmm. NSA is eight times the size of the Central Intelligence Agency. Really? Central Intelligence Agency is not licensed to function in country. They're not allowed yeah. to spy. Here. Right. However, NSA, is. NSA can do it. Right. And they network. So there are all kinds of funny little things that go on there. Mm -hmm. The point is that if you, if you could get to the right office and knock on the door, so to speak, and said, I want to know all about UFOs, and if they wanted to tell you, and they won't, they could. And the answer you would get, in my opinion, <clears throat> this is, if some folks are not going to like this, is that we're in a lot of trouble. How so? Um, well, let's back up. Let's go to Roswell for a minute. Mm -hmm. Instead of the Roswell story, I want to tell you a different story. Now, I have different hats that I wear. I have a police hat that I wear when I do my investigations. In other words, I run my investigation just like I would a police operation. Okay. All right. And that hat is a, a little uh, discomforting because to people that get questioned, because I don't care who you're, I'm not there trying to believe your story. I just don't care. 
The cop ad has one job, and that's to find out exactly what the facts are, and it doesn't care. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's not here. It's not sympathizing with you. Right. In fact, if I catch you lying, I catch you in any way fabricating or, or losing your stuff in the story. Uh, that's going to be a, a quick end of that story. Mm-hmm. I'll just walk off. <clears throat> um, in the cop hat uh, is an illustration. Uh, it, it incorporates uh, other professionals I use as, as well. And, and we've got retired LAP police captains and other cops and stuff that work with me on this stuff as well. Um, uh, I give people uh, handwriting analysis courses and I mean uh, tests and so on. They're saying I'm a handwriting analyst as well. We're looking. I'm looking at you in every sense of the word when that cop hat gets on. Mm-hmm. When you're there, I mean, I'm 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 going for the gold. And if you've got a real story, I'm going to find that out. If you've got a bogus story, I'm going to find that out. If you're mixing up fact and fabrication, I'm going to I'm going to catch you on that too. <clears throat> My UFO hat, so to speak. That's you know, so to speak, uh, the one all of us wear, so to speak, and we're all interested in UFO phenomena, it'll listen to anything. When the cop hat gets on, that's a different story. When the medical science hat gets on, that's where we uh, do the surgeries or do medical work and all our medical team, our doctors, cardiovascular surgeons, and others, that's, uh, that's where they come involved uh, with, with this work as well. And then there's another hat that I call the intelligence hat. I used to be in the intelligence community. And I know a, a little bit about uh, intelligence work. And it's, this is the amazing thing that I found when I started studying UFOs in a grand way after getting out of the CIA is I found, isn't that incredible? They function just like we do. They lie. They lie consistently. They fabricate. They create these cover stories. They create information, false information, disinformation. I mean, it, it was just amazing, the stuff that I was reading and hearing from these people. This is, this is the same stuff that we did. <laughs> mm. My point is that it was, was there, it's an intelligence, it's just an intelligence operation on a much bigger level. Now I want to bring that, put that hat on for a minute. Instead of the UFO hat, if I have that on and look at Roswell, we all sit around and clap our hands and say, yay, Roswell, UFO crash. However, when my intelligence hat gets on, and I hear the Roswell story, it doesn't clap at all. Really? It looks at things totally different. Let me tell you what my intelligence hat looks like when it sees Roswell. Okay. And I'm not, and I'm not fabricating this stuff. I'm telling you that I've got evidence, uh, anecdotal and secondhand, and, and a witness that has some firsthand information that corroborate my information. And this information is not out in any book anywhere period. I'm not a Roswell investigator, never claimed to be, and don't want to be. None of my business. I mean, abductions work, and that's it. But here's what I have found in the meantime when I put my intelligence hat on and looked at Roswell. First of all, Roswell happened. There was an event. The mere fact that the United States government has changed their story at least three different times alone, lied three different times, tells you that something went on on an intelligence level whether it was UFO related or not. They wouldn't lie about something three times in a row for the last 50 years if there wasn't something important going on. So the next question, was it alien related? Or whatever that means, and I'm not sure what an alien is, so I'm just using the term generically because that's what people identify with. But the fact is when I look at the Roswell with my intelligence hat on, I see a totally different story. For instance, if you wanted to invade the country. There's a new movie coming out that's based on an old movie called The Day the Earth Stood Still. Right, right. And uh, they're here to say the planet shows on hold and all that. Well, I'm of another opinion. Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic that there's a better answer than that, but I'm not really sure yet what that is. When I put my intelligence hat on, it sees with different eyes, and it has a different education, and it has it it's, has a different system. It's a... <clears throat> If you wanted to invade the United States or any other government, what would be the best way to do it? We should land on the White House lawn and give a gift to their president. No, we'll all be watching you for the rest of your existence. <laughs> Half of them will welcome you and say, they're here to save the planet. Oh, my God, they're here to fix the ozone hole. And then you've got other people with their guns and everything out there sitting out in the woods waiting for you to come eat them or something. You know, I mean, right. you've got these two major mentalities that are going to, they're going to, I don't have, I don't share either view. 
My view is this. If you were going to infect or in some way invade, and if you're a spy, you would definitely do that if you're spying on a culture, how would I get into your country? Well, it's easy. All you got to do is crash a couple of UFOs. Let them capture you, and they'll think right. they won. Right. And they did. So you bounce a couple of UFOs off each other. It doesn't matter how many of them die, how many of the little guys die, because you got to understand these entities think of those little guys that they capture that we got out and out of the Roswell event. Think of them as toasters. So what that six or seven little toasters got unplugged? Hmm. That doesn't mean anything to the alien. The important thing was one of them lived. Now, is there any you, any abductee out there that doesn't have a that doesn't know for a fact that any of these entities can sit in front of you and once they access you, they can download every bit of information in your head instantly, very quickly. Well, now we have an alien. We've captured a flying saucer. We have an alien entity. And all of a sudden, the next day, the government changes its mind and says, no, we don't. Why didn't we put out this story of flying saucer we captured? And No, there, it, was a, it was a weather balloon is what it was. Well, the problem is that, in my opinion, the United States government, after reviewing some of the bodies and the entity that lived and the craft, and they probably saw it doing weird things like healing itself up in places, uh, probably got a different view that we probably don't know what aliens are if these are aliens or what a spacecraft is if this is a spacecraft. And they got freaked out, changed their entire story, and said there never was any kind of event and then hauled off the craft. The problem is that the United States government, if you had an alien creature and he's in your control and you're in charge, who would you put in in front of this entity, the dumbest person on the planet or one of the smarter ones? Big mistake. They put in the top general and of our military industrial complex at the time. So but it wasn't down, long. They downloaded everything. They knew our defenses. They, they knew everything. They got him. And what's okay. really weird is I, I, hear, I heard statements from one of my witnesses that that individual told That general told his relative on his deathbed, <laughs> this is horrible, the alien and him actually became friends. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> what well, general is this? I can't, I can't divulge that. I'm sworn to, I, and, until I get these two people together, okay. agree, one of them will talk and the other one won't. And if okay. I can get the other one to agree, I'll tell the whole story. I'll, I'll put, uh, put everything. I don't care. I have no secrets. I will, uh, but I have to honor their mm -hmm. the, the violence because of that. Okay. So the bottom line what is a terrific this. way to start an invasion. What, is, what an insidious and clever way to go about it. Let us okay. think that that there, that, that we're, we're, we've got the upper hand when in reality, all they're doing is gathering all kinds of data and evidence on us, you know. the sophisticated techniques in, in a heartbeat. Exactly. So then if that's, the, if that's truly the case... What, why the need to keep on collecting it after 50 years? Are, are, is it that, there, is it that their, their scheme or their plan is to gradually infiltrate over a long period of time, and then one morning we wake up and it's not like it's supposed to be? You're in a cookbook. <laughs> no. uh, yeah. The fact is that, in my opinion, Sir in man, opinion, right? we're, we're just <laughs> in the speculation mode right now. And this and 50 cents will get you a bad cup of coffee, not, yeah. even a, not even at a good coffee shop. So the speculation is all this is. This is not fact or medical or science or anything. This is just speculation on my part. In my opinion, uh, the intelligence community and the United States military, what few actually know about this, you have to understand information is so compartmentalized in the intelligence community and in various areas of the government that most people are never going to know, even if you were working, but let's say, let's for instance, <clears throat> let me give you, a, this is an example in my book. I, I wrote a book after 38 years. <clears throat> the book is called uh, Alien Hunter, The Evidence and Light. It's a, it's a pretty decent read uh, about abductions and how to find physical, how to find your own evidence, actually in your own case. Where we get the book? 
the book is it's it's a, it's a decent read. The how do we is, how do we get the book? To well, the book is, uh, it's on the it. website, or you can email me and say, "Hey, send me some information on the book, and I'll send you some information on the book." Okay, alienhunter.org. dot org. Yeah, or Daryl W Sims at Yahoo dot com. Just my name and D E R R E L W S I M S at Yahoo dot com. And uh, you can do that, and it's got a ton of stuff in it. In fact, the MUFON uh, new training manual is taking some of the – they asked permission if they could take some of my work on uh, research on uh, uh, infrared, uh, ultraviolet uh, uh, detection techniques and uh, evidence that we found uh, as early as 1992 and use them for their manual, and I agreed to this. So that's part of the new MUFON training uh, procedure. But the the bottom line is that for me there is um, there is this huge um, and I'll give you an illustration of this a huge um, gap between uh, the, in, in in our thinking. In other words, if, simplistic people say the government knows everything. Well, they, they don't know what they're talking about. The government don't know much of anything. Most of the government doesn't even know what the what the other part of the government's even doing. Uh, you can just call in the government agency and ask them what, what, what's going on there, and half of them don't even know what's going on in their own office, much less in their, that, that department. Um, case in point, in my book I give an illustration. This uh, Ted Oliphant, who is the 5th Alabama cop who uh, got a lot of credit for discovering cattle mutilation stuff. He's not the only, certainly the only one. There are plenty of good investigators that did this uh, back then. But uh, he did some wonderful work, and he and I were discussing academy relations. And, and uh, when I went out to San Francisco, he says, uh, Daryl, I want to talk to you about academy. Uh, and uh, I said, okay. He said, he's buying my dinner. And uh, so I ordered a big steak, and uh, he looked at me and said, <laughs> he's setting me up. He's setting me up. I mean, this whole thing is music. He's setting me up. I mean, this big prime rib, and he says, I want to know about academy. His girlfriend, but she just, her wife, whoever it is, just leans back against the, the wall, and she realizes this going to sparks are going to happen here in a minute. And I said, I really don't know anything about cattle mutes, uh, Ted. Uh, you're the authority in this. What in the world would you ask something like that from somebody like me who doesn't know anything? And he looked at me, and he, of course he's a cop. He, he's got his cop hat on. Uh-huh. See nothing. That answer is <laughs> not the right answer. So he says, I want to know about cattle mutilations. I want to know what you know. And I said, well, I said, I've read a lot of stuff, you know, in generically, but I said, I honestly don't really know anything. And he just looked at me and leaned forward, almost over my steak now, <laughs> a couple of wolves fighting over a piece of meat. And he says, I want to know what you know about cattle mutilation. I said, well, you did pay for dinner, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I suspect you have at least three kinds. He said, what kinds are those? I said, the first kind is done by them, and I pointed upward. He said, who's that? I said, them. The second kind is done by us. And he said, who's that? I said, the intelligence community, of course. And I say specifically. He said, who else? I said, the third kind are done by people who worship these beings, and they don't know how to get in contact with them. They wish they were abductees or contactees, but they're not. And they think that if I somehow or another can just mutilate an animal like they do, it'll establish rapport and they'll realize that we're like them too. Well, I news for the alien is doing it for vastly different reasons. It doesn't give a who why you're doing it, who you are anyway. They don't care. So uh, I said in each of these events, you can markedly see the difference between each of the three modalities of surgical work. As it's crystal clear. I think Dr. Altshuler and others proven this to some degree. He said, uh, what else do you know about, about this stuff? He got real, he got, his voice changed a lot, much softer. And I said, I think some of your cattle glow in the dark. <laughs> his face turned white as a sheet, and he said, what color? I said, Blue, I should suspect. And he said, where the hell did you hear that? I said, I, I said, good night, Ted. I said, I used to be a cop and an intelligence committee. I'm not completely stupid, you know. I can find things out. I said, besides, our cattle glow in the dark, too. And he looked at me and said, are you telling me your abductees 
who got fluorescence on them? I said, yes. Where? I said, various different locations. Depends on whether it's procedural or whether it's through casual contact. Is there, are there different colors? Yes. Is, do they mean something? That's yes. <laughs> oh, my God. That's like I said, I don't know anything about cattle mutilations. Now, you, if you had asked that about aliens or something, I'd have told you a different story. And when you're talking about cows, I don't know much about cows. But here's my point. If NSA, who does know, not all of NSA, only a group, and a small group in NSA knows this, right? Let's say maybe 500 people in this gigantic team. Know, know what's going on and so on, and they're functioning in NSA. Now, all of a sudden, they call DSP satellite, that's the super secret spy satellite stuff, 18 of them floating around the, uh, the geosynchronous orbit up there, 2,300 miles up, can read your watch if you're real still. That's sort of, and that's not classified. It does a lot better than that. The point is that all of a sudden, DSP gets a call one night and from NSA, and they say, we need to know if there's any... Uh, Fluorescence on any cat, in the cattle or deer population within the, between the 200 and 300 uh, uh, nanometers. If you see that in your orbit there, would you just report to us? Well, certainly, sir. Now, you, you see, NS, see, DSP isn't in on it, so to speak. They don't have any idea why these people are asking it. All they know is they have the authority to ask for information. All of a sudden, you, they, 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 your satellite goes over and it picks up a, 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 a blue fluorescence on a cow in the middle of Podunk, Kansas. Then all of a sudden, uh, a black helicopter, a short period of later, goes out, picks up a cow, and steals it from this Podunk, Kansas farmer's uh, rancher's uh, place. And he, maybe he gets up in the middle of the night, sees a black helicopter, steal it off. And, and Ted said, yeah, that's what I'm saying. See, there the government did it. And I said, Ted, you're missing the whole point. Why did they take the cow to begin with, and how did they know it was out there? The government can grow their own cows on their own field. They don't need to go out. They don't need to risk a helicopter and getting caught and everything else, go out stealing some man's cow. They want that cow because that cow is pre-marked by them. Uh, they want to know what they're doing with that. So what is it? Do you, do you have any ideas? Well, it has to do with mad cow disease and it has to do with a number of things. Now, Ted's big take on this, and I think he's right on this, I think he's absolutely right, is that they're the United States government, specifically NSA and others involved in this, are interested in the mad cow population. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was on a, this radio program you know, about 10 years ago and I had my DSP satellite scientist on there with me, and I said, well, this is an incredible device. And he said, it certainly is, blah, blah, blah. And I said, uh, can I just uh, play the host here for just a second? He said, sure. And I said, can this thing uh, uh, detect uh, uh, in the infrared range, uh, could, it, could it detect uh, a heat ratio of several degrees difference? He said, yeah. And I said, could you give me an illustration? He said, sure. He said, uh, if, uh, if an animal is or a person is hotter than another one, it can detect that, the difference between that if it's about five different degrees different. And I said, okay. It can do that from 2,300 miles up. And he said, yes. And I said, uh, here's the big, the big question then. <clears throat> when when uh, mad cow disease happens to a cow or a deer, are they hotter than the other animals that are not infected? He said, yes, over five degrees. I said, does DSP pick that up? And he said, yes, it does. Hmm. I said, are you telling me that you knew all along? And he got real quiet. I said, do we have a mad cow disease problem in the deer po and elk population in the central part of this country? He said, yes, we do. Really? Duh. <laughs> now, the question is, well, some might say, well, did the alien do this, you know, or whatever. I, I don't know what, the, what they're doing. I don't, I don't know what they, they did it or didn't do it or that they're interested in it. What I am interested in is why they are interested in mutilations. And one of the things I do as an abduction researcher is study mutilations. And, of course, now Ted and I get in this big argument. He says he still thinks it's all the government. And I said, well, Ted, you're my brother, and I just love you to death. But you're wrong. He said, <laughs> well, I'm right. And I said, you got a case, make it. And he made his, he threw his case out there. And I said, I said, don't, don't make me shame you right here. <laughs> he said, yes, I can. And I said, and I will. I said, let me lay it out for you. He said, all right. I said, I've got cases of cattle and human mutilation. 
He said, okay. Human and cattle mutilation. Some of the meat, especially in the humans, has been sliced. He said, okay. I said, this was in the 1800s. Now, what, what, who, in the CIA, who do you think did that in the 1800s? Hmm. He said, oh, man. I said, this thing is so big. I said, you're just on the tail end of this, and you got, you got the part of the, that involves the government. And you're absolutely right. But it's much bigger than that, Ted. This thing is huge. It's much bigger than that. The government part of it is absolutely, and I think he's right on target with it. I do. But the real question is, why have they been doing this for so long? We've got cases out of Brazil. i got two dead children in Dallas, Texas, uh, dead from their abduction event. Um, I mean, you know, if they're here to save the planet, fix the ozone hole, they're sure butchering some folks doing it. And they've been pretty rough on some uh, abductees. How prevalent. Now, they don't do that all the time with all, everybody, but they do some. And they, they, it goes back to them. They get to keep, I keep, people keep asking me a stupid question, and the stupid question is this. Well, don't you think there are gray aliens and, like, bad aliens? No, I don't. I think that the alien, that goes, it goes back to an in, improper and incorrect view of the alien, whatever he is, or it is. If the alien is manufactured, let's say, as an example, or cloned or whatever, then he's probably programmed with what he's, he's going to obey whatever orders he gets. He doesn't have any good, warm, fuzzy feelings about anything. All he wants to do is survive and do his job. He's not here to save the planet. He's here to make sure he stays alive as long as he can stay in the game. Hmm. So somebody else is bigger than him calling the shots. And if he's told to make you love him, to fall in love and to become a – some of your audience is not going to like this. If, they're, if you're programmed and he, they're t they tell him to program you with a screensaver memory, they're here to save the planet and you're here chosen and special and unique and all that, uh, you're going to buy that story in most cases. And yeah. you're going to be just like Prophet Yahweh, and you'll be out there parroting the same stuff. They're here to save the planet and fix the ozone hole, and they're going to help us, and they love us, and they care for us. And I don't care what you say. I just love them anyway. Well, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care what anybody believes. But I do care what evidence shows. Evidence is the name of the game. And evidence shows, and you put your, your intelligence hat on, a lot of that stuff just melts away real quick. If you're spying, if you're, if you're landing, if you're land on a planet, or if you're going to, do anything. I mean, when, when the conquistadores, when they landed in, in South America, the, what did they do? They sent out scouts. They did this. They did that. And then they and they met with the natives. And then they did this. They befriended them. And after they they uh, finally got in, found out where the gold was at. Then they killed everybody and took them off slaves. He said, "Well, that's that's history, and that's mankind doing evil things to people." Really. Well, if you go back to Sitchin's work and other people like that, if you want to buy into his stuff, go back to ancient history, I mean, way, 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 way back in ancient Warkin, Sumerian, ancient Hebrew times, and so on. When the so-called alien came here and they looked like Greek gods back then, hmm, wonder why that is true. Uh, Nordic, so to speak. And they looked like these Greek gods, and they made themselves as gods. Uh, they took over mankind, and guess what they made man do? Mine for gold. Mm -hmm. Curious, huh? Well, they're here to save the planet. Those Nordics are really neat guys. Want to bet? <laughs> they, they, my point is, is they're not. They're neither good nor evil. They're not either one. They're just here to do their job. And if their job is to barbecue you, slice you up in thin pieces in the 18th century, they will, and they'll do it with equal enthusiasm. If they need, if they're told to. Make this one believe that we love him, he's special, unique, and he's our spokesperson for planet Earth or whatever whopper they want to tell you. Mm. You will do that, too, with equal enthusiasm. You know, the thing that really makes me wonder about when, when we start going down this, this particular avenue is whether or not we're, we're engaged with some sort of parasitic organism here uh, uh, you or mean, some parasitic sort of species that, you know, their, you know, their definition of... of uh, they're actually, we're cohabitating with them in the same sort of environment, and we cannot fathom what, how they get their jollies, but their jollies are certainly uh, interacting with us in this particular manner and um, presenting themselves in this manner, and maybe, they're, maybe they feed off our energy somehow. Well, I think you're right, and, and I would like to make a clear distinction, if I may. You're about three steps ahead of most folks. They're... Uh, <clears throat> I thought he there was is, four. There, there is a... <laughs> <laughs> it's 
it's about ten steps ahead of me. There's <laughs> about uh, there is a, a lady was abducted the whole entire family. The the event after years of this finally destroyed the family. They split apart and they all went their own directions. <clears throat> And I, uh, the husband ended up in a uh, in a psych ward, uh, not 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 terribly, just from the event. Not not that there's something wrong with him. He just so sh- he just shakes all the time. He's just gets terrified of these events. He doesn't want to remember them. What he wants to remember is everything is wonderful and kind and sweet and lovable and adorable. But the fact is, all the people who saw the events wide awake, all his kids and his wife, they didn't report that at all. But that's his screensaver, and that's what he holds on to is because he, he'll lose his sanity if he doesn't. I mean, this is just horrible. Anyway, the wife <clears throat> won't talk to me. Uh, she, everybody else did, but she wouldn't. A year later, she calls me and says, Mr. Sims, said, uh, you're still doing your UFO investigation? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, is there any way I could talk to you? And uh, I said, sure. So I brought my, uh, my lady that does the camera work. She, she always goes with me on these events. And when she set up the camera, the lady said, what's she doing? I said, she's setting up the camera. She said, I can see that. She said, what is she doing here? And I said, uh, she's always here when I question anybody, especially a woman alone. Really? Well, I don't mind. I said, I do. I do mind. Yeah, good answer. This is the way business is done. Right. We don't do it any other way. Absolutely. And I, it's very acute, very sharp, and uh, she's going to film the entire event. And she says, well, I don't understand why. I said, now, you called me as a professional. Is that correct? She said, yes. I said, there are things that happen in these events that you know about on a conscious level, things that you know on subconscious levels, and then there are things you don't know about at all, period. And it's better if it's on film and you review it later and discover it yourself. And she says, oh, well, I don't want to do this. And I said, if you don't uh, follow my instructions right now, I said, I will pack everything up and leave, and that will be the end of this conversation. She said, okay, okay, we'll do it. So she set the camera up and started filming, and I started speaking to the lady, and I said, so, she said, what are we going to do? I said, we're just going to do some close eye processing. She said, what does that mean? Let's close your eyes. <laughs> she says, okay. And a few seconds later, I just told my the lady, I just motioned for her to be quiet. And this lady starts looking around the room with her eyes closed. She says, what do you want? And she's talking to her doctor, her MD. The alien doctor that you referred to? That's the screen memory. Okay. This is why hypnotists and therapists need to be extremely, extremely careful. This is how you get sued and lose multi-million dollar lawsuits in the court of law. Therapists in California, PhDs, often will listen to these stories and say, oh, my God, your parents sexually assaulted you. Oh, hell, I know. Your doctor in this case. Now, you want to accuse a doctor? See, and the hypnotist goes along with this, and a lot of these PhDs do this, and this is how you go to court, and you lose. The doctor was never present. Now, I already know that. She notices the doctor's assistant is walking around, and she keeps watching, wondering why he's he doing it with the screensaver. Mm-hmm. Alien entity that's what mimicking visually her and any hypnotist knows this. So all you got to do is do a stage hypnosis show and tell everybody I, I'm going to leave and when I come back I'll be invisible and, uh, and then bring out a little handkerchief and wiggle it in front of them. And they'll all see this handkerchief floating in midair, thinking it's floating and there won't be anybody there. Mm-hmm. They'll laugh because they'll see you with the handkerchief, <laughs> but the people who are hypnotized won't, and that's the point. It's suggestion. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. Anyway, she's involved in this. And long story short, he sexually molested her, and she cries and cries. Very moral lady. Very. She cried and cried and cried and cried. And uh, at the end of the session, I said, uh, "Do you see why we like to, to um, film these?" <laughs> I said, "Kind of good evidence that uh, no one was near you. You were filmed completely, and you recounted an event that apparently was very real." And she says, why did you do that? And I said, since you're probably never going to see me again and probably never want to have anything to do with this phenomena again, I think I'll go ahead and tell you what he was up to. Since it's probably never going to go anywhere other than here. <clears throat> she said, please do. And I said, the best way to think of him 
I said, first of all, he doesn't have any genitalia. He has no sexual feelings for you, period. None. He wouldn't know what it was. However, he's been programmed to know what to do because it's been done before. And the thing is, he knows exactly what to do. And it's better to think of him as a tape recorder so that he can play those emotions, the feelings, the fears, those passions, and so on, back to someone else who can better appreciate it, someone higher and more worthy than he is. He's just a tape recorder. I said, quit trying to make these guys aliens from other planets that are doing whatever. I said, he is an instrument of someone else's will. That's the point. This thing is far bigger than you imagine. And it's far different than anything anybody else imagines that I've talked to. Far more said, alien than they ever think, uh, ever consider it to be, I think. It's got to be an alien because we're smart. But when we used to be smart back uh, in the 1700s, they were uh, genies and things like that. What I meant was far more alien in the sense of how, what we're comprehending. Um, yes. You know, it's not, you know, it's not, you know, aliens with big eyes and uh, whatever the phenomena is, it is far more uncomprehensible to the human mind than we give ourselves credit to think that we can comprehend. Does that make any sense to you guys? Uh, it just seems to me like um, it may not be. We may not be able to fathom it. Well, I, I have a model that, I, that may help. Uh, and uh, we can throw it out here and see, see if it catches any fish. If it doesn't, then uh, that's okay. I don't want to do that. I want to throw it on the wall and see if it sticks. No, no, okay, we, no. we'll, we'll try that too. <laughs> we have a wall and we'll do something else. The map is not the territory. But if the map is accurate, it can help you to get a more accurate description of the real territory. In other words, when you look at a, at a map in your car, you're not looking at the state of Texas or whatever it is you're looking at. You're looking at a map. Right. That map is not the territory. If the map's accurate, it can get you to the right location if you're smart enough to follow it. And now, uh, using that model as an illustration, <clears throat> map is not the territory. Crop circles are not the territory. They may just be maps. Right. Implants are not the territory. They may just be maps. The fact is that what we're dealing with at best is a map. And the fact is UFOs are not the territory. They may, they may just be maps too. If you carry this, this metaphor to its logical conclusion, the menu is not the meal. It may look like the meal while you're looking at it, but no matter how close that picture looks like the meal, I assure you it's not going to taste like it if you try to eat the menu. <laughs> You've got to wait till the meal gets there before you find out that, that that's not the real thing. And there are people out there thinking UFOs are the real territory. They may just be maps. So what is? Well, the waiter's not the chef. This is a common error of abductees. The alien who picked you up is not the guy in charge, in other words. He may just be a map or a menu or something else. Yeah, he answers the puppet master. It, uh, it turtles all the way up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. So what do you think the, the agenda might be of that at the, at the highest echelon? Of that hierarchy, Daryl. Well, funny you should ask that. I'm writing a book that's uh, two books away called Hierarchy, and it's about the entire thing I've learned in the last, God, I'm going to date myself here, nearly 50 years. So you're, uh, let's see, 29. Uh, oh, <laughs> we like to suck up to our guests. <laughs> That way they come back, Daryl. Yeah. <laughs> well, Grant, well, Grant yeah. eat his monkey. <laughs> Daryl, you're the best guest we ever had. How's well, uh, probably the, <laughs> the last one, too. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. All right. So do you want to do, do a quick 
abbreviated synopsis of what you think the agenda might be? Well, uh, I will be very forthright and tell you that anybody that tells you, in my opinion, including me, that tells you they know the big answer to it, mm -hmm. they don't know what you're talking about. So, okay. The alien is guarding that information so secretive that I found a little piece of it and divulged it to them through this system, specialized system that I developed. Uh, and I, I highly enjoy anybody listening. Don't do this at home. <laughs> uh, trust me. I, I know I, I know what I'm talking about. And let me give you, if, if, well, we may not have time to do that, but uh, Dr. Carla Turner uh, and I were friends, and before she passed away, and she wanted me to get posted my suggestions to her abductees who were being taken away by these aliens and government types or whatever was going on. And I told her, that's a huge mistake. You don't want to do that. And she said, but I do. You, you need to do it. You have the skills to do it. You can do it. And I said, sweetie, I said, let's suppose every word they're saying is true. I said, I think there's something else going on there, but let's suppose it's true. And they get taken to some underground base, and then I show them how to, how to hypnotize this guy and do this and everything. They grab the guy's machine gun. I said, you think she's actually going to get out of there alive at this point? Yeah. She's not coming home. You just had me kill your abductee because she's going to defend herself now, and they're not going to bring her back. I said, this is a huge. I said, you're not looking. She said, oh, I had no idea. I said, let me do the thinking here. On the, on, on the intelligence part of this, and you just do the moralizing uh, from your armchair. I said, trust me, you don't do this at home. You don't know what you're opening here. And believe me, if you are successful and, and something works and they don't like it, you're going to get a visit. You're not going to like who's coming to dinner. All right, let me ask you one last really quick question. Uh, we've only we got less than two minutes left, so the uh, question is, do you think that aliens communicate via EVPs, EVPs at all? Uh, there, I did EVP research, uh, gosh, a long, long time ago, uh, before it was popular, and uh, uh, most of what I found uh, was nonsensical, and, and a lot of it was uh, even mm -hmm. fabricated by the investigators. But uh, the fact is that some of the stuff, definitely had voices, and some of them were backwards, some of them weren't, um, is that, in fact, related to UFO phenomena? I doubt that it is. That's another another aspect totally. Okay. And it, I just don't think they're related personally. Okay. Um, Priscilla Wolf says to tell you hello, and we are winding down to the last minute. So... Um, Absolutely fascinating discussion, Daryl. Uh, if, if you're willing, we'd love to have you back and talk about more things. Uh, we've had a, a, a number of great comments and interesting stuff. Thanks for taking your time. Would you uh, re restate your website and yes. see if you can get that? I, my website is uh, www.alienhunter.org. Uh, email is D E R R E L W S I M S Daryl W Sims at yahoo.com. Priscilla, thank you for listening. You're a you're a real hero. That's another another one of Native, Native Americans out there. Forty five percent of Native abductees are Native American and Indian Irish. Anybody that writes me, I will write them back and send them information if they're so interested in the UFO or abduction phenomena. Mm -hmm. The only problem is uh, when he started moving toward me, even though I was paralyzed. I <laughs> I freaked, and I pushed as hard as I could for my, uh, against the wall of my little bed, and I fell down uh, in the covers. Uh, the, my head and part of me and, the, and my real legs were up, still partially up on the bed. I fell between the walls. The bed pushed apart from the wall. I fell down there and got wrapped up in the cover. I mean, it was a mess. And then this thing, I thought, you know, that was, that was at least good because I wasn't seeing him. And then all of a sudden, he, this time you talk about a bad, bad Horrible. I mean, if it was a nightmare, they couldn't have been any better. He lifts up the cover on my bed under the, underneath, and there I am looking at him, of course, little tiny bed, mm -hmm. and there he is looking at me face to face with that large black eye and those large bulbous head. And, uh, man, I mean, it's just like something out of a, a nightmare because I, did, I didn't see monster movies back then, but it, have I, I've seen them since, and that one definitely could take the cake. And I kept shaking my little head over and over, back and forth, and yelling, no, 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 because I knew he was kept trying to program me to think of a circus clown. 
he, that was going to be my screen memory. He was going to make me think I had a bad dream and I saw a circus clown. Now, he didn't shapeshift or change his image into that. He tried to change my thinking to think he was a clown. Mm -hmm. Well, after uh, 40 years of investigation, I'm still of the opinion he's a clown. But the fact is, he wasn't the one that he was trying to make himself out to be. The fact is, what he was really doing was trying to influence me and make me think that that event never, ever even happened. Well, it did, and I remembered it, and I wanted to remember at age four who he really was and what he, what he was there to do. And rather than the whopper, he was trying to get me to believe that it never even happened. So that was, um, for all intents and purposes, it, it, there's another observation that was interesting, too, I, I think. Maybe your audience would be use, find useful, and some of them may already know this. But when I looked at him, I was puzzled. I sat up in bed, and I was actually puzzled. I mean, I couldn't figure out, first of all, who he was and what he was doing in my room. And he, he, he didn't have any clothes on. When he turned around, I noticed he didn't have a TT. I mean, if you don't wear clothes in a room and a bunch of little kids are there, what do you think they're going to look at? <laughs> They do. I, I mean, have no idea. Well, and they they would definitely anybody probably most most people would anyway. But I know he didn't have a TT, and I did. He didn't have a belly button. I did. He didn't have uh, nipples, and I did. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. I still hmm. hadn't figured it out. I had no idea what an alien was. I mean, I didn't have a clue about any of this. I just couldn't figure out why he wasn't like us. Well, after 38 years of investigating. I finally decided that um, that if you don't have genitalia, you don't reproduce. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a navel, a belly button, you didn't get here by birth. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have mammary glands, you don't suckle. So whatever they are, they're not anything like us. They're either manufactured, cloned, or hatched, hmm. or some combination thereof. We have some physical evidence that indicates that some of these guys might be biological and metallic. Borg. I don't know. Interesting. Now let's um, let's go back to one thing that you said. You said that the fear you felt was essentially the entity's fear, correct? Yes. Can you expand on that, or do you know much about that? Or, uh, we'll be talking with Daryl Sims tonight. And before we get into that, I just wanted to kind of give a heads up on Paranexus. We've made some changes, and I wanted to announce those on the show tonight as well. I did announce them in the newsletter today. But we've done some restructuring. We've opened up the forums so that uh, the public can register and join in on the, most of the areas of the forums without being a Paranexus member, but we'd love to have you as a member too. We are doing some different things. We've added a blog for forum members if they'd like to do that. We've also got an a updated gallery, which is going to be a little easier to use. But probably one of the more exciting things that we're working on is we're discontinuing the World Alliance Partner Program, and we're working to build the network of field investigators who will undergo some pretty decent training, and that's going to be coming up in the next month or two. And so we're getting some indications of interest of folks who would like to be a part of that field investigator program. And we'll be making more announcements and giving more information as the uh, days and weeks unfold here. We have given a new facelift to Paranexus as well and made it a little simpler, and we'll continue to enhance that as we go. So just wanted to mention that. Take a look at Paranexus.org. We'd love to have you as a member and share your expertise, your knowledge, and your experiences with others of like mind. One other change that I should uh, announce as well is we're really tightening the focus a little bit. We're going to focus really primarily on parapsychology, and along with that in the parapsychological field would be the hauntings aspect. The parapsychology and ufology, along with abductions, is going to be really the focus. We're kind of letting cryptozoology go as a, as a, a focus area. It's just really 
Not so much in the anomalous field. It's more in the naturally explained field, and they will even state that, the, the cryptozoologists, even though we're still interested in it, very eclectic interest, and we will still continue to have folks on the show who are cryptozoologists and so forth. So take a look at paranexus.org. We'd love to have you as a member if you're not already. Uh, tonight, we'd love to have your call-ins if you'd like to give us a shout. Our numbers are on your screen, 347-945-7799. There's also the click to talk button on your screen. If you've got a headset on your computer, you can click on that and connect with us as well. Otherwise, join us in the chat room. If you've got questions for Daryl or any of us tonight, you can type them in there too. So without any further ado, let's talk uh, with Daryl Sims. Daryl is a registered hypnotic anesthesiologist, certified master hypnotherapist, certified master neurolinguistic practitioner, international speaker, licensed private investigator and researcher of alleged human alien encounters. His discoveries of the alleged alien implantation, implantation rather, around 1960 and fluorescence around 1992 found in abduct on abductees due to contact by alien entities are but two of his finds in the medical scientific dream team that he uses to explore. His presentations have been to the medical and scientific conferences to, to show compelling approaches about alleged human alien contact events. We're really excited to have Daryl with us tonight. Daryl, welcome to Paranexus Universe. Oh, it's, uh, this is totally my pleasure. I mean, I'm really enjoying this tonight. This is great. Oh, it's, it's so nice to have you. Yeah, we really appreciate your time. You know, I, I was watching reruns of UFO Files here a week or two ago and saw you on that uh, doing a, a regression. Was that with Donna? Donna Lee. Donna Lee. She was one of my that was on uh, uh, Bill O'Reilly here a while back. Mm, he really? treated uh, both of them with great respect. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my uh, um, extremely, and I mean, when I say extreme, I mean far left, way out there friends. Mm -hmm. uh, called me and said that uh, Bill O'Reilly will experiment in South America. I yeah. win. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not sleep paralysis. I said, now, she wants to debate sleep paralysis and these events that occur at night. She might have some grounds to argue. Sure. But not daytime. Mm -hmm. I said, so we win. Yeah. Well, they bo didn't bother to put that in the interview at all. Wow. Well, and then I showed them all kinds of evidence, and they, uh, and they, and scientific evidence done by uh, science labs from you name it, Los Alamos, New Mexico Tech, uh, everywhere, and uh, they didn't include any of that. Why don't you I mean, bring I, us up to speed on how you got into this, how it all started? Well, that's uh, that's, that's a story in itself. Uh, basically, <clears throat> how this all happened for me, I guess, I guess you could say I was a captive audience. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, yeah. I'm an abductee too. So last week I couldn't spell it, and now I are one. <laughs> uh -huh. That's funny. The fact is, so did 19... your experiences take place in childhood, Daryl? 1952, age uh -huh. three and a half when it started. Uh huh. So uh, I, uh, it was uh, in Midland, Texas, in um, 1305 Ohio Street. Excuse me, that's not correct. It's 1005 South K Street, Midland, Texas. And uh, my mother was watching, she's 80 years old now, and she was watching a program on History Channel or something a while back, and she says, Daryl, they, I mean, I know you did the UFO investigations, but, well, I was watching a program, and they said you were an abductee. And I said, uh, well, uh, yeah. And she says, well, that's not right. And I said, uh, well, actually it is. Well, that's hmm. impossible. And I told her the same story I'm telling you. And she says, but how could you couldn't remember when you were that young? I said, Mama, I said, the address is 1005 South K Street, Midland, Texas. She said, how do you know that? And I said, I lived there. <laughs> well, just because I was little doesn't mean I was stupid or didn't have a memory. That comes later. <laughs> that's, 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 just ask me. <laughs> I, so anyway, I, I told her the story. I said, I... I said, uh, you'd put me in bed, and uh, you guys had gone off, and uh, I said, I'd starting to drift off sleep, and all of a sudden, uh, I noticed something was wrong. And I sat up in bed, quick and I noticed somebody was in the room. Uh, they were actually leaving the room, and I couldn't figure out, well, where, first of all, I didn't know what it was or who they were. 
and I couldn't figure out where they were going because they were walking to the, toward the wall. I mean, there's no door there. Hmm. I mean, that didn't make any sense to me at all. It was obvious that I had, uh, now that I looked at the story after much investigation, I caught them as they were leaving, going out through the wall. When they realized, this entity realized that I was awake and watching him, he realized he had to fix the problem. You're not supposed to remember these events, right. not the truth of them anyway. So he came back, and uh, as he turned toward me and looked at me, I noticed he had large black eyes and long skinny arms and skinny legs, and uh, had he had perfectly round uh, round black eyes, not not the elliptical eyes you see in the Hollywood version of the alien now, but uh, back then in the 60s, they had perfectly round black eyes. And uh, people asked me, well, what do you, how do you account for that? And I said, I, I, I don't account for it at all. It's, it's just what it is. And I said, the only possibility I can think of is I was looking at a Ford model and you guys were looking at a Lexus. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he says, what do you mean? I said, I think you got my, my message there quite clearly. I said, you're just looking at different models. Right. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, and it's, it's one guy was interviewing me one night. He says, he said, well, there are at least 69 different kinds of races of aliens. I said, now, how do you know that? <laughs> how do you know that? First of all, have you ever seen an alien? No. I said, you ever seen a UFO? No. you ever seen this? you ever seen that? No, no, no. I said, okay, then how do you know anything? I said, you're just parroting what somebody told you. You don't have, you don't, in a court of law, you couldn't testify because you simply haven't seen or been there. And I said, first of all, uh, the 69 alien thing, I said, Let's, um, I said, I could tell you a story about that and where that story first came from. And I caught the guy, he was here in Houston speaking at a, at a, at a dinner with uh, me and, and uh, another guy with some rich guy. And uh, he'd, he'd ask us to come speak. And my, my point of this whole thing is that... Uh, there was there was this awful uh, guy there who was a pretty was pretty prominent in the UFO field then, and uh, is now. He finally got debunked, and everybody realized he's a liar. But he was out telling the story about these 69 different races of aliens. And I told him, I said, uh, I said, well, where do you where do you get this information? And he looked at me kind of funny and says, uh, well, uh, 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 well, and I said, go ahead and tell me. And he said, well, they tell me you can determine whether people are lying or telling the truth just by watching them. I said, I'm very good at that, actually. You're kind of watching me, aren't you? And I said, you, you better believe it. <laughs> he said, <laughs> I mean, uh, this is right in front of a, a, a millionaire that you know, has $14 million, and he's got a, this big dinner for this bunch of businessmen. He's invited me, and this guy, he flew this guy in. I couldn't believe it. Oh. And, uh, and so I just bumped this guy in front of me, and I said, well, where did you get this story? And he said it... <laughs> He said, actually, we made it up. Oh, no. And wow. um, I said, that's, um, I said, you know, the problem is if I, if I expose somebody like you at a UFO conference for lying and doing this kind of stuff, I said, they consider me a government agent. I said, however, if you sit here and admit it in front of everybody, you're just a liar. I said, the problem is you're going to go to conference next week, and you're going to, you're going to go ahead and, you're going to go ahead and uh, tell everybody the whole story again, and that story still prevails, the 69 alien story, and that's where it came from. He's one of the people that was called the Gulf Breeze Six. Hmm. And this is a matter of public record, the, this whole story I'm telling you about. It happened in Houston, Texas, and he sat there and admitted he made, it, made the story up. And, uh, I mean, I, I, you just wouldn't even believe the story. Anyway, uh, back to my... <laughs> my little story in the in the little room and in the abduction. But the end of it, the entity uh, saw me and he realized he had made a, apparently he'd made a mistake. So he's moving toward me. And then at this moment, I became instantly paralyzed with enormous fear. Well, two things were wrong with that that picture. Number one, I wasn't paralyzed the moments before, and two, I've never been that afraid in my entire life. I, I mean. I mean, I'm only three and a half, four, nearly four years old. I don't get major fear. I just right. get it. You know, there, there's no, there's no frame of reference for me. So it took me years to figure this out, but uh, I'm a little slow. 
but uh, I finally figured out that it was his fear he was adding to me. Huh. Really? That's one of the. That's a whole story in itself. Yeah. It was in that fear and that paralysis that he installed this. This paralysis is a suggestion, and the fear is something he actually installs in it. And uh, the next thing he started doing is moving toward me. Where they, generally, when they do that, they're going to put that large black eye right next to your face. Mm-hmm. And they're going to reprogram you with what Susan Clancy and Dr. Blackmore would be very, very happy to hear, what a true false memory really is. And that's when the alien gets close to you and he, he automatically uh, programs you with a nonsensical bit of imagery, usually a large black owl with large black eyes or a deer or some other nonsensical creature that you know wasn't in your bedroom. Squirrel. So you think it's a bad dream. My part, I kind of laughed and I said, uh, I don't think so. They went on and were treated uh, very kindly. And he no looked way. at them and at their story. And he said, my goodness, I would, I would keep that uh, to myself if that happened to me. I mm. mean, uh, it's just amazing how well he treated them. Wow. Interesting that, is, that is amazing. Yeah. CNN called... Uh, sure, it was Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> Yeah, it was definitely Bill O'Reilly. He's, he's, he was <laughs> fair with him. The uh, in the end, uh, by the way, called uh, about t- a week later, and uh, they sent th- uh, one of their main producers out here and spent two days at, uh, a, at a little ranch. And um, they were the ones that didn't treat us fair. Uh, they swore to, the, to buy everything uh, real that they would, and... Um, and in fact, uh, the regression you're seeing there is from the CNN uh, production, and they they did everything they could to make it look like it was at nighttime and he was fuzzy. He wasn't fuzzy at all. The the man was abducted uh, when when he was a child numerous times with another little boy. The police uh, there was a police report there, and I mean this thing was just all over the news. And then the kids all of a sudden show up clean across Houston. Wow. Uh, and they knocked on the lady's door and said, it's getting dark, you know, we can't find our mom and dad. And, and the lady said, oh, my God, you're the, the little boys that are missing. And she calls the police, and they couldn't pick them up and said, all right, who got you? And, of course, they couldn't describe anything other than an alien entity. Mm. Uh, well, you can imagine, the, well, this happened numerous times to them. Of course, CNN tried to make it look like it was a bad dream or something. This was in broad daylight, 11 o'clock in the day. Really? When this, um, this is not... I just, I just couldn't believe the uh, the uh, dishonesty that CNN uh, laid out. I just, I just couldn't believe it. Yeah, well. Well, you know, but 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 you know, by the same token, Daryl. I mean, when have we ever seen a real? Well, I mean, there's always exceptions to the rule. But when have you ever seen a documentary by a major network that really treats the whole subject fairly? It seems that they all come in with a tongue-in-cheek attitude on just about anything, whether it's ABC, CNN. I mean, uh, Miles. Uh, I'm trying to remember the fellow that was right. in some more. Yeah, I did, did, did a thing on UFOs not too long ago, which is kind of tongue-in-cheek, too. Yeah, he uh, actually, he called me uh, about uh, three weeks ago and uh, said he was coming to Houston, and uh, he con- contacted my media consultant, and uh, they worked the deal out uh, in writing that um, we would, you know, I generally get this stuff in writing when I can, mm-hmm. uh, and how, how the material is going to be presented, and... Uh, Lo and behold, I uh, didn't hear from him for a week, and she wrote him and said, are you still coming? He said, yes. And then this week, he, there's a big news blurb. I just got an email today. It says he and six other people, at major hitters at CNN, quit. Really? Oh, so, I didn't I, hear about that. Wow, that's pretty wild. Got his, everything. I thought, well, there goes the interview. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I reamed him about uh, how bad the CNN did this program before. I said, now, a lot of UFO people would probably like it because – because it's good press. Mm-hmm. I thought I didn't like it because it was not what they said they were going to do. I, right. They wanted me to debate, for instance, Dr. Susan Clancy and Dr. Blackmore yeah. in, in uh, Harvard and, and, mm-hmm. and in England. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, there's no point in discussing yeah. that I said, because I already won. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? That's, I don't no like that attitude. And but that's not even said, really I, their area of expertise, I wouldn't think. Well, you just said Dr. how Blackmore. they... How can you do that? And I said, it's very simple. I said, Dr. 
Uh, Susan Clancy's work is based on uh, the premise that uh, this is sleep paralysis or some uh, other fixation thereof. And she said, that's correct. And I said, and she said, what's wrong with debating that? And I said, uh, over 64% of the events that occur are in daylight. The people are wide awake when it happens. It mm. goes up to 92%.